Right. Good evening. I call this meeting of the Round Rock Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. It's 5.30 p.m., March 14, 2019. We do have a quorum. Uh, if we'd all rise for the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one indivisible. All right, we'll go to agenda item C. Closed session, we have none. And uh, before we get started, a couple of uh, things. We have a couple, we do have a quorum, but uh, Ms. Feller, you want to give us an update on your? Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm going to be stepping out at about 6.10 or 6.15 tonight. My daughter's being inducted in the National Honor Society, so I'm going to slip out. I'm going to go attend the ceremony at Cedar Ridge, and then I'll be back as soon as it's over. And so. you're going to listen on the way there and the way back, right? Yeah, I will. I will think about that. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm planning on it, but if I don't, if I do, then I'll, if there's any voting after while I'm gone, I'll keep on. And if I don't, then I won't vote on anything that I missed. Be but, free to do that. So, Mr. Moses, are you going to be here for? Um, yes, I do have a prior commitment that. So, 7:30 is kind of my pull the rip cord time. But so that's okay. just FYI. All right, just let everybody know here. And then, of course, Dr. Flores is um, away. Uh, this evening with a family uh, funeral, and so Dr. Presley is in, sitting in instead. So would you like to introduce our new guest here? Yeah, I would uh, echo uh, Dr. Flores is out of town for a, a death in the family. There was a, f a funeral today, so he will not be here tonight. And I also want to introduce uh, Dr. Kenneth Oddix, who is our new CFO, who will be here tonight. We, uh, uh, you've been here a full two, almost a full two weeks so we appreciate you, and we look forward to working with you. So thanks for being here, sir, and uh, thanks for coming to Round Rock. Great. So this is a, um, a workshop, and um, we will just uh, have these agenda items here, the action, two action items, and then the discussion items after that. But um, otherwise, it's a little bit more informal than our regular meetings, and um, our whole progress, our purpose here is to get uh, some of these topics out of the way and make some progress. So with that, we will go to agenda item D, action items, adoption of a res reimbursement resolution number four for projects funded by bond 2018. First day, welcome. Thank you. So good evening, uh, President Chadwell, members of the board, and Dr. Presley. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you how glad I am to, to be here. Uh, it's been a busy two weeks, but I've met truly a bunch of uh, great, great people and I'm looking forward to, to working working here and kind of the experience is analogous to merging onto 35. You just got to get in and get in and go. So, <laughs> so here we go. I have two action items for, for you. The first is a reimbursement resolution for 12 items totaling just over $12.7 million. All of these items are included in the 2018 bond. The purpose of this resolution is to provide the initial funding so that the POs can be placed to begin these projects. We're working on the bond sale and expect to have bond funds available in early May. When we get the bond funds, we will repay the general fund, any funds that were used on these projects. I'm asking for your approval, and Mark is here if you have any questions. And just for uh, clarification, I think you have it written in here, but again, this is to accelerate before we sell the bonds. We're just borrowing this money briefly, and then once the bond sells, it'll go back into our fund balance. So. Exactly. And it gives you a an advantage to uh, get started on some of the projects. Ms. Vesa. So will most of these, um, like, so we have student laptop carts and devices and um, language labs and fine, are, will, will these be purchased in time for the start of the new school year? Is that the intention? All right, and I'll let Mark, you wanna- Do you wanna come up? Um, come on. <laughs> you have to turn it on. <laughs> yes. Okay. So will that be all all the campuses or like I'm just trying to ask questions so that people watching can yeah, know. Yeah, we like, have what a refresh schedule uh, okay. for devices uh, on a five year refresh. And those campuses that have carts of laptops or Chromebooks or or iPads, 
if they reach their five years replacement cycle, we replace them okay. this, this summer, and it will be done before the start of school year. Very good. Okay. With that, uh, anybody, any other questions, comments on it? I don't know if your lights, I don't, your lights aren't working. Oh. I'll try it again. There it goes. All right. Ms. Feller. So I just had one question for um, Mark on the the description of the projects on the district-wide uh, 741 D014, which is the interactive flat panels for elementary and secondary. Yes. Can, can you explain that a little bit? I thought we had done interactive at, at elementary and just flat panels at secondary. Um, what, what you see there is uh, uh, the board actually approved uh, interactive flat panels for the elementary schools and projector slash HDMI cabling and speaker refresh uh, for the secondary schools. Uh, we do think there's possibilities that we can actually put a non-interactive flat panel at the secondary schools okay. for about the same cost. In, in fact, uh, last night we met with uh, Jeff Usum and led an effort to bring elementary school teachers to look at the interactive flat panel option. And then tonight, as we're meeting right now, uh, a group of secondary teachers are looking at the option of the projector with HDMI cabling, as well as the non-interactive flat panel. Okay. And the funding that you have there is to get us started in purchasing uh, this technology. Okay. But please note, there, our projectors are on a five-year refresh schedule, so there won't be many, there won't be much replacements uh, for the next six months, uh, but there will be some this summer. Okay, thank you. Mr. Moses. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the board adopt a reimbursement resolution for the projects outlined in the resolution that the 2018A capital, fund, capital Projects Fund 640 be amended by the amount of $12,740,782 that the transfers be made from the general fund to cover the expenditures as incurred. Second. I have a motion and a second as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify raising your hand. Motion carries 7-0. All right, thank you. Go to agenda item D, two, approval of job order contract for local area network land cabling services. Dr. Oddix. So the next action item involves a job order contract to provide district-wide cabling projects. The district issued an RFP and received four proposals. These proposals were evaluated by the technology staff, and the highest rated proposal was Convergence Cabling, Inc. The second highest ranked firm was Big State Electric Limited. We recommend approval of Convergence Cabling, Inc. as the Tier 1 awarded vendor and Big State Electric Limited as the Tier 2 awarded vendor. As Tier 1, Convergence will receive all orders until they or the district determines that some of the work needs to be done by Big State Electric. And recommending approval. Okay. Mr. Moses. Mr. President, I move that the board approve Convergence Cabling, Inc., as the Tier 1 awarded vendor and Big State Electric Limited as the Tier 2 awarded vendor to provide local area network cabling to the district upon successful negotiations of the, of the contract award. Second. I have a motion and a second for the cabling as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify raising your hand. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Go to agenda item E, discussion items, legislative update. Ms. Caputo and Mr. DeLeon. Good evening, President Chadwell, trustees, uh, and Dr. Presley. Um, we do have a legislative update for you uh, this evening. As you know, last week was a busy week at the Capitol. Friday was the deadline to file bills. And, of course, on Tuesday, the House unveiled HB3, which is uh, known as the Texas Plan, and Marty's going to go over some of that, as well as SB4, which is the Senate School Finance Plan, which uh, came very late, I believe, on Friday evening. <laughs> um, and also this week, uh, 
the House Pub Ed Committee did hear uh, testimony on HB3. I believe it was about, it was just under 12 hours worth of testimony. I was there for a little smidgen of that. I didn't stay until the wee hours. Um, almost uh, 100 people testified, most on or for the bill. So Marty's going to go over some details and other bills of note. Good evening, President Chadwell, tr trustees, Dr. Presley. I have a, a short update on what has happened so far at the Capitol. Primarily, uh, House Bill 3 is, is uh, consuming a lot of uh, the attention and, and time of lawmakers. So without further ado, the House Bill 3 is uh, one of the best bills I've seen in my 20 years of, of doing this uh, legislative uh, consulting. It is... Uh, it does so much, uh, and it, they, they managed to put it in only 186 pages. Uh, so that's an accomplishment in itself. Um, if you can see, the basic allotment has increased by about uh, 17% um, over the current basic allotment, and that is a significant increase that uh, we have not seen uh, in, in several sessions. Um, and the question you probably got to ask is, how do we get there? How do we get such a large increase in the basic allotment? Well, looking at all these repeals, the cost of education index, the high school allotment, and so forth, um, all those allotments are going to add up to about $3.5 billion annually. And uh, the goal is, uh, of House Bill 3 is to update these allotments, uh, streamline allotments that aren't working anymore, that are inefficient, and... Um, and, and to make the basic allotment more robust and ultimately for you as a board to give you more discretion on how to spend those dollars. And um, I'll be uh, uh, turning to, to your CFO to give you more context on what some of these repeals might mean or what does the increase in the basic allotment. And uh, at a minimum, the increase in the basic allotment will likely translate for most districts in an increase in teacher salaries. Uh, that, that's, I mean, if, um, your CFO will tell you, but uh, over 80% of your budget is already dedicated to personnel, salaries and benefits. And uh, as we all know, an increase in the basic allotment usually means a reduction in recapture, and that's a good thing. Some of the other uh, cool things that we are seeing in House Bill 3, uh, the comp ed weight is uh, now going to be uh, based on a spectrum, looking at the, the diverse needs of students in need, uh, and so that is uh, much needed. When 6 out of 10 of our kids in public schools are on free and reduced lunch across the state, uh, the comp ed weight is, is in need of, of an update. The, um, the transportation allotment, is also, uh, hasn't been updated since 1984 or in over 30 years. And now they've moved uh, to a, a simpler model where it's just going to be $1 per mile uh, per student. Um, it, it's better than the, the current model in which Chapter 41 districts don't get any transportation money. Uh, a group of kids that have uh, been sorely... Um, underfunded. Uh, in fact, you don't get any funding for the, from the state for kids who are identified dyslexic. Uh, so now, for the first time ever, there's going to be a weight assigned to these students. Um, it, it should be noted that the chairman of the Education Committee, um, Chairman Huberty, has a child that is dyslexic. He himself is dyslexic, and I believe the speaker is also dyslexic. Uh, one other note about uh, NIFA, the last bullet, the new instructional facilities allotment. Uh, this is uh, a large increase from what is currently being funded. It's actually a hundred million dollars a year, so that's two hundred million. Currently, the biennium only provides forty-five to forty million dollars. 
very modest amount. This is going to help with new facilities uh, that are being constructed and with the economies of scale, this will help um, cover those costs. Recapture is, is finally getting a facelift. Um, the, the, the new calculation is not going to be based on uh, the equalized wealth level or a district's wealth. It's going to be based on what the district can raise from its tier one uh, tax rate. And it, if, if it exceeds the tier one entitlement, then uh, plus the available school fund per capita, then it is recaptured. It does not completely solve the issue of recapture. But what House Bill 3 does is, um, by putting more money in the basic allotment, overall, the price tag for uh, recapture, uh, the, the amount raised by districts like yours, is going to be about $7.7 .7 billion if we do nothing. House Bill 3 puts in $3 billion towards recapture, so it takes it down to $4.7 billion. What does that mean for Round Rock? Uh, we don't know exactly. There's some preliminary numbers. Our state representatives have those numbers, uh, but again, they're written in pencil. I wouldn't take them as the gospel just yet. We are, we're still in the early stages. Also, uh, and this, uh, they're, they're looking to do some tax compression. If you recall, in 2006, we went from $1.50 to $1, and now uh, they're taking us, uh, school districts, um, those that are $1, taking it down to $0.96. Cents. So they're going to uh, recapture, excuse me, um, compress our tax rates four pennies. And the question um, I have, and, and it's been on my mind, is when you ever you, you compress taxes, hopefully there is money to reimburse you for that lost revenue. A lot of questions are about this bill is where is the money going to come from? How is it going to be sustainable? Um, tax compression always gives me pause because in 2006, we, uh, we updated the franchise tax. It was supposed to generate $7.4 billion. It never came close to that number. Uh, and it's, it's always been a struggle for the legislature when they talk about tax compression. But it should be noted, the speaker... Lieutenant Governor and the Governor, they want to do tax compression. They see that as property tax relief. So uh, keep that in, in your back pocket. Uh, the Golden Penny is uh, going to be decoupled from, or rather I should say it's, it's worth less uh, in this bill and, and going forward. The Golden Penny is uh, a penny that the state puts in more money towards and Really, if it's, if it's tied to the Austin yield, it costs the state a lot of money. However, they have raised the value of a copper penny, which is just as good and, and uh, will take. But uh, again, this is apl applicable to districts that are going to be raising their tax rates. Think of it this way. If you are at a dollar four now and you want to go above that, those are your copper pennies. Excuse me, a dollar six. The copper pennies aren't really worth that much today, but under House Bill 3, they will be worth more should the, this district and others consider uh, raising taxes. Again, I talked about the tax compression. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, it, there, is, there is a couple of cool things about the tax compression. In the first year of the tax compression, if you look at the bottom bullet, the last bullet on the slide, uh, no district will be able to uh, access a golden penny until the second year. Um, so in, in 2020, no one gets to raise their taxes. But in 2021, everyone can, um, school boards can access that golden penny by a mere vote of the board, and it has to be unanimous. Here's more uh, information about the uh, tax rate compression. Uh, we were capped at $1.17. Now the cap, the new cap is a dollar thirteen. Again, the role, the goal is tax compression, and and that's what uh, House Bill Three is is trying to do. Um, in uh, in addition to school finance, uh, full day pre K. This is um, uh, a long time coming. I think everyone has seen the research. Students who are in a pre K program generally are on grade level. They know they have early literacy, early numeracy. 
Uh, if they're reading by, on grade level by third grade, uh, the outcomes are, are great. Um, the, um, uh, those districts that are doing the local ho option homestead exemption um, are not going to see a benefit in this bill. But um, again, th these provisions are, are in pencil. I must reiterate that nothing here is, is set in stone uh, and it is, um, again, early in the process. So again, here's a recap of what uh, 186 pages kind of looks like. I did the best I could in, in being respectful of the time that we have. <laughs> but um, the, the goal is to change how school finance is, has been operating. I thought they did a great job. Um, there's a lot of, of things to look at still. Uh, we can talk about it. But um, anything that helps with districts with recapture, and this district is one of them, is a step in the right direction. If they do nothing else, I think I said this before, if they do nothing else, putting money in the basic allotment is a win across the board. Uh, and that's going to be important because we're going to talk about Senate Bill 4 now. Senate Bill 4 is the Senate's version of school finance, and it's, uh, I, I was able to do it in fewer slides. Um, so the, uh, the Senate still is considering uh, the use of current year values as opposed to prior year values, and, and your CFO can talk about the, the, the pros and cons, but current year values would be a, a step backwards for all of us. Um, they haven't done the the property tax rate compression in this bill, I suspect it's going to be in Senate Bill 5, and it's, um, it's going to be uh, related to the homestead exemption, it looks like, at this point. Um, I see Senate Bill 4, I should have prefaced this, more as a placeholder. Um, there's a lot of blanks in this important bill. Um, I don't think the Senate was ready, but they, they were bumping up against the deadline to file something. Um, the most important thing uh, you should note on this slide is you see the repeals, the CEI, the high school allotment, the GTL. These are the same exact repeals in, the, in House Bill 3. Uh, having done this for so long, it, it looks like a foregone conclusion that the CEI and these other allotments are also going to be repealed. The repeal, all these, these, number, these, uh, these allotments they're worth $3.5 billion a year. So this is a new pot of money that the legislature has. And so, um, again, losing the CEI, uh, I think for this district, is going to be impactful. But if you go back to the very, very first slide on House Bill 3, if it means the basic allotment is going up, you know, losing the CEI is not a bad thing. The... Uh, uh, other parts of the bill, the, again, the, uh, I highlight a transportation allotment because I think now I, there's agreement on both sides, the House and the Senate. It is time to update the transportation allotment. Again, it'll be a dollar per mile. Um, they may have copied the homework from the House. Not a bad thing. Uh, we're just happy to see uh, some, some uh, effort towards that um, issue. I don't know that we'll actually see uh, agreement on the, the golden and copper pennies. It, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be technical. Um, but a, if there is agreement on the, the repeals that I mentioned, there's agreement on the transportation allotment, if there's also an agreement on raising the basic allotment overall, and we get out of town on May 27th with just that, this is not a bad school finance um, plan going forward. Um, the Senate is expressing reservations about the cost of House Bill 3. The House version is about $9 billion, roughly. It's actually 6 And then the other uh, balances on property tax relief. The, the Senate wants to spend no more than $6 billion, uh, four of which is going to be on teacher salaries. And the other $2 billion are going to be on property tax relief. So already we're, we're going to see an impasse. The um, Senate Bill 4 does have one thing that I would have liked to have seen in the House bill. Uh, it has a fast growth allotment. 
uh, which can be important for districts that are experiencing that growth. Um, they both are in support of uh, uh, an expanded pre-K program. Um, again, that is, uh, uh, hopefully we see that in conference and it survives, but going to full day pre-K is about another, I want to say another billion dollars. Uh, so going back to the collapse of all these allotments I mentioned earlier, which will translate into about $3.5 billion a year, we could fund full-day pre-K. That, uh, that is one of the best investments um, we can see going forward. Outcomes, outcomes-based funding. The Senate seems very high on the issue of outcomes-based funding, um, which was inspired by the Commission's work this past school year. Uh, the past uh, year, they had this special commission looking at school finance and outcomes-based funding was a very hot topic and that's where we're, uh, the Senate seems to be at this point. Uh, but again, it's just a placeholder. Uh, moving on to other bills very quickly. Senate Bill 11 is going to be uh, moving through the process uh, requiring these, these multi-hazard emergency operation plans. The district has something similar, but if uh, in this case they want you to turn in these plans to the Texas Safety Center down in San Marcos, and if you don't turn it in, it could result in a conservator and then maybe a board of managers. I, I see that as very extreme. Um, and it also has the um, a brand new school safety allotment, uh, $50 per student, uh, which will translate into about $270 million a year. Uh, as a, at a cost to the state. Uh, right now, it's, um, Senate Bill 11 hasn't moved just yet, but we're trying to work with the author to uh, soften the, the consequences for failure to turn in these, these operation plans. Senate Bill 500 was just voted out of the Senate. Um, there's $100 million for school safety. It's largely a bill to uh, help those districts impacted by Hurricane Harvey. Uh, they've lost a lot of ADA. They lost property. Uh, but what is important about Senate Bill 500 is um, through uh, some input from Dr. Presley and, and Trustee Moses, we did amend the bill to, to include money for uh, fencing and radios, uh, even bullet-resistant glass. Before, it was only limited to four items. It was vehicle barriers. It was exterior doors with uh, push bars. It was um, camera systems and um, I can't remember the, the fourth one. But uh, at a minimum, Senate Bill 500 gives you more flexibility. And now that it's going over to the House, and this is going to be an opportunity for the district, hopefully, to, to see um, some gains in that area. I mentioned the school safety allotment. These are standalone bills. Uh, House Bill 9 is... TRS has, has gotten uh, not the same amount of attention, but when we're talking about the salary increases to all the teachers, everyone has, has at least in testimony, pointed out, don't forget, there are TRS contributions that have to be uh, accompanied. So House Bill 9 seeks to increase the state's contribution, uh, which is important. Senate Bill 2 and House Bill 2 are, are in pause mode uh, Members are hearing from local elected officials, this is not going to be good for us. And despite the, uh, uh, the exception for uh, in Senate Bill 2 that allows communities, municipalities to pay for uh, first responders outside of that cap, uh, there's still not enough votes to move Senate Bill 2 and House Bill 2. And that's why uh, they have, we've not heard much about them. Senate Bill 3, I've told you, it's going to cost the state $4 billion just for teachers and librarians. It's a $5,000 pay increase. It's a large increase. And you should note that House Bill 3, a lot of the, the opposition to House Bill 3, remember I told you it's one of the best bills ever written? There was opposition to House Bill 3, and it was coming from the teacher groups because there was not a specific provision calling for a salary increase. I would argue the increase in the basic allotment is going to translate into a salary increase. Uh, and I would say that 
school board should have that local control to decide how to disperse that salary. Senate Bill 3 is very limiting. Um, and then finally, Senate Bill 5 is discussing the, uh, the possible increase in the homestead exemption from 25000 to 35000 Again, I see that really, merely as a placeholder, um, but uh, it is, the goal is property tax relief, and that's, that's Senate Bill 5. Um, I've tried to condense my presentation as quickly as I could. President Chadwell. Great. All right, uh, I've got a couple quick questions, and then um, uh, just real quick, uh, back to the one with Dallas Ace on page. Uh, you didn't go into much detail on that. That's been getting a lot of press uh, discussion. Slide nine. Slide nine, thank you. And um, Thank you performance for pay, and that was part of the reason why there was opposition yesterday. Some of that, or yesterday before, was the pay performance, meaning the uh, related. Okay, so House Bill 3 technically has three teacher provisions. Uh, the first provision is increasing the minimum salary schedule uh, mm -hmm. significantly. Uh, the second uh, teacher, perf uh, teacher pay, if you will, is this performance. It's, it's called the uh, Educator Excellence Allotment, I believe. And, um, and then there's a third one, a third minimum salary schedule for all other um, professionals, educators. Uh, they weren't necessarily, I mean, the, the, the House Bill 3 sets aside $140 million for teacher performance pay. And they weren't happy about that, obviously, because it's going to be tying to, to star, per, star performance. Um, but really, the, 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 the anxiety was we want a specific provision that tells school boards and school districts, we're going to get this much in, in a pay increase. And, and so that was the concern from teacher groups. And um, overall, they don't like performance pay. Yep. Right. And it's really interesting that... Uh, with the Texas Monthly article coming out saying that STAR is rigged, and uh, now there's is really some trepidation yep. uh, tying any performance or outcomes-based funding to STAR. But the one thing that also I noticed on the Dallas ISD ACE thing is there was uh, differential pay for uh, going into the uh, more challenging schools. So I didn't know if that was listed in here as well. So Right, yeah, okay. there, is, right. there is that effort to, uh, to recognize... Uh, uh, recognize teachers and exemplary teachers and master teachers. Incentivize them to go to to right. go into these harder to teach right. um, campuses. Okay, Miss Vesta and then Mr. Math. So on that question, on the merit pay question, you said that um, they had 140 million dollars. It was my understanding by watching the uh, hearings that it was something that you had to opt into as a district that to to provide merit pay to access that $140 million. And that based on the language that I saw, though a standardized test would be used as part of the evaluation formula, they didn't specify STAR. And, nor, and they gave the local school boards more discretion about how the program would be put together. So, I mean, it sounds like if a district doesn't want to do merit pay, they don't have to. They just don't then don't access that $140 million of merit pay allotment that you could access if you put together your program. And if a district doesn't want to rely on STAR or... Um, only rely on STAR a little bit, uh, then that's the, it's up to the board to, to create a program that meets the needs of the, the school district. Right, right. So the uh, couple of uh, points. Uh, uh, it is available. It is not required. It's, and it's actually the educator effectiveness allotment. I just want to be clear. Uh, and admittedly, I, I did uh, have a conversation with the speaker's office about this, these provisions, and uh, they said that um, it wasn't a finished product just yet, and so they're still working on these provisions, but uh, it's going to be available should districts want to use uh, this funding. Great. Mr. Meth. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces that we looked at, and I heard a lot of um, they're still putting pencil to paper, um, and um, 
I was wondering if our new CFO had done any research as to quantifying some of the moving pieces. So, for instance, I'm a big fan of what I call good guy and bad guy accounting. You know, so if there's an increase of in the basic allotment, to me that's a good guy of X. If there's a reduction in Chapter 41, you know, that's another good guy. If there's tax compression, that's a bad guy. Um, I, I know you've only been on the job for a couple of weeks, but I was wondering if you had any quantification around any of those items. Yeah, so give you this backdrop. I emailed back and forth with, you might have heard the term, Omar Garcia. He's the one that publishes, like, he produces each year the Excel sheet that all the CFOs use to basically calculate how much your state funding is going to be given all of your student counts, all that sort of sort of thing. And so emailed back and forth with, with him and you know, asking if there were any runs out and uh, he said there aren't any and literally that it's, it's bottom line, it's too early in the game to be, because it's literally a thing of, hey, in hearing all of this and all that sort of thing, the, the devil is truly in the, in the details because to give you an example, the, the first thing that catches your eye is the basic allotment going from 5140 to 6,030. I mean, my eye would just, wow, you know, that's because that's a, a huge thing. We're roughly like 60,000 WADA. Well, every $100, that's $6 million to us in additional funding, plus the recapture, you, you gain $6 million on the, on the recapture piece, so, so that's huge. But so initially, you might think, well, if the basic allotment is at 5140 and I'm going to 6,030, that's a huge increase, okay? But the devil in the details piece is, like Marty said, the, the CEI going away. Well, when you do the math on that, that's like 12%. So it's like take 5,000 and increase by 12%. So now you're at 56, 5,700. So now you're not talking about this spread, you're to here. You take the high school allotment away. Well, now you're not talking the difference from here to here. And so with any of those variables left, well, I don't quite know this number, you don't, you don't have the, the picture. And so to me, it's at this, because I've done this game a, a long time, and it's right now, to me, it's like trying to catch the wind because, you know, House Bill 3 is fundamentally different than, than Senate Bill, and they're going to have to ultimately come together and, and make a decision, and even to the extent that right now there aren't even any runs that say, hey, for Round Rock, here's the price tag. Here's how much your funding would, would be. Senate Bill, here's what it is. At, at that point, then you start to have a fundamental understanding, and when Omar presents the model, then you're allowed to sort of what if. Well, what if they're, they're this much apart, so you, you model both ways, and you say, okay, what if this, what if that? And so from a budget development piece, it allows you to establish a range. Hey, if, 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 the, house is, if the house is here and the Senate is here, and they met somewhere in the middle, you, know, you take your worst case and your best case. So then when you're doing your budget, it allows you to establish the parameter. What do you, what do you have in the worst case? What do you have in the best case? And then what are you willing to, to sort of place your, place your bet with? And you know, our reality, and we'll get into this when we do the uh, when Roseanne and I present the, the budget piece, but what we're having to do from a budget development piece is literally say, look, at this point we're building a budget that says, look, under, under current law, because we don't know what's going to happen, current law is telling us here's the level of, of revenue and here's our expense structure given what we know at this point, because this is just a, a process. Literally, numbers change every day. You, you know this, you make this change, you make that change, so it's a, a fluid process. But as you, as you know more, it's all about what do you know and you know, the gift of time? The more time, the more you, the clearer the picture becomes. You know, unfortunately for, for us, given our fiscal year, you know, we've got to make literally uh, next month, uh, and that's going to be bringing in, because TASB is doing a study right now in terms of what, <coughs> how our pay compares. And so going to be bringing forth a recommendation to the board saying, hey, if we're going to do something, we've got to change our, you know, teacher pay, all the different things by, whatever percent we decide to, and, and so that'll be a, a cost piece there. So I'll get into more detail on the, on the budget piece, but truly at, at, at this point, all I can tell you is there's not enough to, to even sort of frame the deal other than I know where we are. If they didn't change anything, I know what that number's about. Beyond that, there's not enough granularity to know. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Ms. Fessa. I mean, when we were at the Capitol today at the Central Texas School Board Association meeting, they were talking about runs that, and the, the offices seem to have some runs available. We got some preliminary estimates that seemed um, 
promising for our district. I mean, they all told us they were very pre preliminary, not, you know, firm at all. But it seemed, I mean, based on my rough calculations, it seemed like it would it would definitely help us considerably. Have you haven't they they haven't con I mean because I know they had them at the Capitol. The no, I don't mean I don't have them right now, um, and it is a deal of when I when I have them, you know, I'll be able to you know come back at y'all and say, look, okay, here's the Senate, here's the here's the House, and and here's the the parameter, but it's you know in sort of context. When Marty was saying, "Hey, on the Senate bill, there's blanks," you know, well, okay, there's not going to be anything I, I from can, the Senate bill, but the scenario. House bill. They had some House preliminary runs on the House bill. So, so I guess back to Marty here. I've got a question on page three. The transportation. You said it's by miles, one dollar per mile. Is that still beyond the two mile radius? Is that, uh, is that, or? Uh, so yeah, they did not address that statute. Um, it is just going to be whatever your transportation. Um, and this is regardless if you're Chapter 41 or 42. Right. Okay. That's good. Um, and then uh, what the, the tax compression on page 8, It's this is what you were saying is, Steve Math, I think you were saying this is a bad guy or whatever. It sounds like they're taking it. This is, on one hand, they're giving this compression, bottom line, the maximum tax rate. Is that what that's meaning, the 113 um, instead of 117? Well, so they're actually starting at a dollar and compressing all districts to 96 cents. And uh, so what we're used to is dollar 17 being the, the, max. the max, but the new max will be a dollar 13. It's a different way of looking at it, but you're, you're right. It's uh, okay. Just Sorry. to be clear. Good guy, bad guy, depends on your perspective. If I'm paying a tax check, I'd rather have my tax rate com the, or the base compressed. But if I'm a school district and I'm collecting revenue off of that, then I'd rather That's not true. have it compressed. That's true. But That's we get again. our revenue based on a formula. So whatever the formula determines is the amount per student that we receive, the state is obligated to pay the remaining, the difference between what we collect in local property taxes and the amount that the state has determined we get based on our student demographics and the current law, the weights and whatnot. So I, I see it as a good thing, like because it's saying that the state's going to contribute more towards the cost of public education and local pack taxpayers are contributing less. So I'm, I don't know if that's a correct um, determination there. I've heard a couple times in the last few days it's going from roughly 35 to 41 percent and then the state contribution, I, at least preliminary. So I know a lot of this stuff is is TBD, a lot of blanks in there. You said it right. There's a lot of details uh, missing with that, but uh, I certainly appreciate that date. Ms. Vesa. So I think the thing that has been coming up the most in the testimony and certainly what I've heard about the most in terms of my neighbors and constituents is the worry over the gifted and talented allotment being absorbed into the basic allotment and so can you talk to us marty about whether um whether those who are you know impacted by the gifted and talented program should be worried about that um so the uh, gt allotment is in the is one of the repealers there's like 40 over 40 repealers it's 42.156 and uh, right now every district is allowed to identify 5% of their students as GT and those students are worth uh, 0.12 uh, in the uh, school finance formula the repeal means the GT student doesn't have that value anymore you can still have a GT program but you don't get the extra funding uh, and then it would be up to districts like yours, school boards, to decide uh, how much money to allocate for your GT program. It's going to be a lot of work for those parents that are concerned that their board's not doing enough for the GT um, programming. And so um, 
their repeal is very concerning to, to that community. Um, it is a set aside and uh, it's been being absorbed into the basic allotment. So you still have the ability to spend money on the GT program. It's just not a set aside. I wasn't trying to give Marty the hook, but I did, I did want to add that um, Chairman Hewarty said that over and over again. It, it's, it's not that the funding's going away, but it's up to the local school district because it is going into the increase. I don't know if, um, Ms. Estes, if you wanted to talk a little bit about our, our uh, focus that we put on, on GT programs and just sort of the philosophy of Round Rock ISD on, on enrichment. Yes. Yeah, so I, I do um, envision should all of that come to pass. First, I think that our um, GT parents are probably going to make their voices heard at the Capitol. So I would echo that it's it's a um, in the wind kind of whether or not that will be included. Of course, the um, that will be decided at the Capitol. But most definitely with that increased allotment, what I would envision is that we would take a look at those areas that are cut. Another one that concerns me is high school allotment. Um, there's a, a lot of programs here in the district that are funded out of that that we definitely need to to look at reallocating funds that come in um, in that in that overall. But the thing is, is that they're not actually. I mean, Huberty made this point over and over again. They're they're not cutting the funding. They're just shoving it into the basic allotment. So it it puts the onus on us as the school board to make sure that those programs are adequately funded in our budget. If the onus is you know, not on the allotment, it's on us to appropriate our dollars to support those programs. And and you said you can have a program, but that's not, they actually have to, we have to have a program by state statute. It's not a can or you cannot, you can choose not to have a gifted and talented program. No, you have to have a gifted and talented program. The difference is, is that before there was a pot of money set aside for that program. And now it's up to us, this school board to make sure that really, I mean, in truth, truth, like that our constituents feel like we are providing an adequate gifted and talented program, that we are adequately funding that program. And if they want to complain to anyone, they're going to complain to us because we have to allocate sufficient dollars to fund that program. Yes, I agree with that. Um, it, it perhaps builds in some flexibility as to how much by rolling it into that um, general allotment. Um, I find it interesting just from the teaching and learning perspective, the, the set aside potentially for full day pre-K and for dyslexia. Um, it's, it's a great signal, I think, from the state of what um, they prioritize for districts to, to work on. And most districts, as you pointed out, um, already have and were required to have a, a talented and gifted program. And so that's, that's, those are very robust programs that have been in place. But yes, we will definitely, um, just to, to your earlier question, we'll definitely assure that um, we have the funded, funding needed um, to continue the, the programs that we have for our talented and gifted students. Okay. Any other questions? This, we, we can always come back to this. I think this will be a segue into our budget, which, you know, some of this, so don't go far. Mm -hmm. But for right now, good? Would you have a yeah, question? No, oh, just a, a quick comment because it's, uh, just, it ties into in the legislative. And <clears throat> sorry, this past week, and you know, Chad, I emailed, sent you the email. Uh, I received an invitation to serve on TEA's uh, School Board Trustee Advisory Council. So I'll be. You know, it's just want to look at all that. So, Mario, I'll get with you. I know they'll be weighing in on legislation, on rulemaking afterwards, other things. So I don't want to just to let you all know that, let Mario know that. And then as things progress, I'll make sure to keep you on the loop of what's going on as that ties to the legislature. Great. Okay. Thank you both. We'll go on to agenda item D2, 2019-2020 budget. So Lynn and I are going to present to you and give you an, an update on where we are in the 2019-20 budget process. But I, I thought I would start here, uh, given that I'm the, the new kid on the block, and wanted to just start by letting you know, like, because we're going to, in time, be talking about a, a whole lot of things involving a whole lot of money and all that sort of thing. So what I just wanted to share with you is what, to me, are sort of like 
three core principles uh, and kind of non-negotiables for me in terms of in, in my role as, as CFO. And what it starts with is that basically everyone in this room is, it's a public trust position, whether you're on that side of the dais or, or, or sitting here, that's what this role is about. It's about, you know, keeping the, the public trust. So every decision that I've made in all my time of, of being CFO um, has literally been, hey, some of the decisions are going to come to you for a vote, whether you agree with them or not, and whether you approve them or not, a lot of decisions will be made and, and you'll, never, you'll never see them just because they're below the, the board authorization limit, that sort of thing. But literally my mindset is always whatever decision I make, it's, it's no different than if I had to sit right here and say, okay, here's, here's why this decision was made. It can bear the full light of, of day. You might, you might ultimately disagree with it, but it's going to be a situation where everything we do, everything my team and I, everything that I'm doing is going to be willing to just share you know, what I know. I'm kind of a even though I don't teach for a living, I'm kind of a teacher at heart. I like to know how things work and then tell you, tell you what I know about, about what I've learned. So that's, that's one, that's the most important thing to me. The other is I view what we're doing truly as a competition because as a parent, when you're deciding where to, to live and, and educate your kids, there's a lot of different places you could put your students. There's a lot of different places our 6,000 plus employees could, could go to work. And so the competition is how do you attract the best, how do you attract and, and retain the best talent? And to me, the, the two most, the three most important things there is the salary you're, you're paying people. So TASB is going to be doing the market study to say where are we right now in terms of what we're, what we're paying people. Jared's going to present a little bit in terms of the, the background on what our benefits are. Those are the, the two most important things kind of for almost for anybody in terms of what's going to attract and, and keep them somewhere. The other is the work environment that you actually create. Do people like coming to work, the people they're working with, and how people get along with each other? So to, to me and in my experience, if, if you are able to attain those three things, you've set yourself in the best position to, to compete against anybody, whether they're, whether they're a charter school, whether they're a public school. That's, that's, the, that's the game to me that we're, we're playing, that we're trying to win, to, because the goal is to provide the best education for our kids that, that, that we can. With that, the third thing is I'm about efficiency. Uh, the, the thing that I'm always going to be trying to do every day is get up and try to do it better than, than we did it the day, the day before. And what I've told everyone that I've been in meetings with the last couple of weeks and what I've always told anybody I work with is I simply want the best idea to win. And that's not who had the biggest title that put the idea on there, and it's simply what's the best idea and if that's the best idea, I'll do everything I can to try to bring that to, to fruition. So that's how, that's my mindset um, so that you know where I'm coming from um, when I'm coming to present things, what we're trying to, do, to accomplish in the, in the budget, not only for this year, but it's a, it's a never-ending game. And so with that, in terms of division of labor between Rosanna and I, I'm going to turn it to her. She's going to update you on, like, the last presentation that was done uh, about the budget was back in January. There were some board questions after that presentation, so she's going to update you with answers to those questions, and then I'll give you the latest update and where we are as of right now with the with the budget process from the from the numbers perspective. So, give it to President. Good evening, President Chadwell, members of the board, Dr. Presley. Uh, tonight we will continue our discussion on the 2019-20 budget process. So as Dr. Audix mentioned, on January 24th, we came together uh, and presented the first presentation of the budget process. And what we did is provide uh, background information, we pro provided historical trends, as well as a starting point for the budget. And as we mentioned at that time, budget is a process. And so through time, we were able to define, uh, better define and refine the data to provide additional analysis and updated projections. And so you'll see um, some updated numbers tonight as well. So we're going to begin with historical trends. Uh, the slide on page three uh, in front of you is, is what we presented in January related to the administrative cost ratio. So we wanted to provide some additional uh, clarification. So first, this graph represents the trend for Round Rock ISD's administrative cost, cost ratio from 2005-06 through 2017-18. Now, the footnote... Um, mentions that 27, 18, 27, 
15, 18 data is not yet finalized. So wanted to be clear about that. There are two ways that districts provide data to the Texas Education Agency. That's through the annual financial report and through the PEAMS uh, submission process. And so um, annual financial report has been submitted based on our fiscal year, and the PEAMS mid-year submission was completed in February. TEA has not yet finalized the data submissions. And so that's why we note that 2017-18 is not yet finalized. Also, there was a recommendation to compare the administrative cost ratio um, along with other districts, our peer districts and our neighboring districts. So the next slide shows a comparison based on 2016-17 administrative cost ratio. Again, 17-18 data is not readily available, so we have to look back at 2016-17 to compare. You can see that Round Rock ISD is towards kind of the middle uh, uh, end of the spectrum uh, related to our peer and uh, local districts. We also wanted to do a little bit dig, uh, deeper dig into how administrative cost ratio is calculated. Uh, we've had questions related to the formula. This is a formula derived by TEA. They define uh, administrative costs, uh, the ratio is truly a ratio. It is the numerator, which is instructional leadership, plus general administration, divided by instruction and instructional support services. Now, instructional support services, by TEA definition, includes instructional resources, which is library services, curriculum and staff development, and guidance and counseling. So you take your numerator divided by your denominator, and you get your, your ratio. Next, we wanted to provide some additional data related to the school finance system. Again, with current law, this is no changes in, in place. Based on uh, what we're seeing now, we've added a column for our 2019-20 uh, budget. Uh, and then looked at the change between current year to that next year uh, budget projection. We're looking at, in terms of tax collections, an increase of $26.6 million, which, again, that's, that's a good thing. Now look at our net state revenue. If no changes are made uh, through legislation, you're looking at a decrease in state revenue of, over, of $12 million. Now, recapture is going to increase. We're currently calculating close to $50 million uh, in recapture, which is an increase of over 20.5 million. Now you look at the net of that, and that change from current year to next year, we're looking at a loss of $32 million. Now we're going to talk about our budget assumptions. So we like to say that budget is an estimate at a point in time. So in January, when we talked about uh, our starting point, we looked at uh, these variables because these variables drive the numbers that we see on our budget worksheet. Uh, initially, we looked at property, uh, the taxable property value growth, and we started out at 6%. And we noted then that it, it was a conservative start. Uh, looking at updated data, we now believe that a better estimate is at 7.6%. Uh, in comparison to our current year for 1819, we have 8.66% in property value growth. So we feel that 76 is a better number. Now, we will be receiving certified estimates from Williamson County and Travis County appraisal districts in April. That'll better refine that number or better uh, give us an, uh, an updated estimate as to what truly that's going to be. But we really think it's going to be closer to that 7.5, 7.6% range. Also, on the student enrollment growth, in January, we had a quarterly report from our external demographer. We've received an updated report as of last week. So we're now looking at additional 827 kids. So that's a uh, slightly higher than what we started with in January. Now, these budget assumptions are going to drive uh, the updated budget worksheet, which Dr. Audix will now uh, go through in more detail. Okay. So what we've done is on page 11, we've laid out the uh, what the revenue <coughs> difference is. You have a, a column for what it was back in January of 2024 and what it is um, literally as of, as of tonight. And so, as Rosanna said, the change column of $6 million that's driven by the increased assumption in, in property tax going from uh, property tax value or property values from 6 to 7.6%. The increase in other local revenue is driven by increasing the investment income assumption by just under $1.9 million. State revenue is, is changed slightly by the 181000 as Rosanna said, by Templeton's latest update on the, the student projection for next year. 
So when you go to the total estimated revenue, that's an increase in revenue assumption of $8.1 million from when we talked in January. If you flip to the next slide, uh, slide 12, this breaks out the expenses. And the two changes that we've done there is that uh, we've left, instead of an increase in utility cost year over year, we've left that uh, flat. We believe that's a reachable number at our existing budgeted level. And then the Chapter 41 repayments decreased by just under $2.5 million. The reason for that is that with the way that recapture works is that the latest prior year property tax values are, are lower. And since those values are lower, the amount of that we owe the state in terms of recapture um, decreased by that $2.475 million, million. So when you go to the very bottom line, January's bottom line was just under a $20 million deficit. We're now uh, 11, or a $9 million, just under a $9 million deficit. So we've, we've pushed that deficit down uh, $11 million from um, the, last, the last presentation. So as we said, there's, you know, that's where we are right now with the assumptions that we, we, we know. Um, as Marty said, we're, we're in the middle, we're early on, the, kind of the elephant outside our door is not knowing what the state is, is going to do. As we start having those runs, that'll form, you know, better refine what we, what we do on the, on the revenue side. The, on, on page 13, with what's not included in the, in the budget, as I said early, earlier, right now there's no salary increases in there. We're having TASB do a market study analysis with the intent that we'll come to the board uh, next month to make a recommendation to you in terms of what we think we should, uh, or what we <laughs> is what Annette will be referencing. They're going to basically develop the price tag that if we did 1%, 2%, whatever the percent, we'll be able to know what that price tag um, is. And then the health insurance contributions, and I'm kind of setting Jared up, who'll present next in terms of our, our health insurance piece. The what I'll say there, and it was noted in one of the board questions, and you'll, you'll see it as Jared goes through, what's, what's happened for, for us as a district is what we've been doing, like, just like the general fund is our main checking account. It's what we pay the operating expense with. There's a separate fund for, since we self-insure our medical insurance, and to just so that we're all on the same page in terms of what that means. With that separate fund, self-insurance... I, I didn't know what it was about until when it was at Pflugerville, but, you know, fully versed with it, lived it for a whole lot of years. When you, when you boil it down, it, it's really quite simple. There's, when you, when you self-insure, there's only two sources of revenue for you. It's what do you pull out of the employee's paycheck and what does the district contribute? Right now, the district contributes $370 a month. The employee contributes based on what, whether they're insuring themselves, which plan they're on, their family, that sort of thing. But those are the only two sources of money that are, that are going to come into that checking account is what the district contributes and what comes out of the employee's paycheck. On the expense side, there's basically just three expenses that are being incurred. When I go to the doctor or Rosanna fills a prescription or any teacher, anybody in the district does that, that's, that's what our expense is. It's as we use it, that's what we, what we pay for. The third expense is to administer the, the plan. Somebody's got to process the paperwork. So whoever we contract with, and that's currently out to, to bid, but that's what we're paying for in terms of, of our expense. Okay? What's, when you look at one of the slides that will be in Jared's presentation, what you'll see is that the fund balance that we had for our self-insured account, if you back up five years ago to 2014, it was very healthy. It was over $20 million. Okay? So five years ago, we had $20 million in that account. But what we've been doing for the last five years is we've been subsidizing our plan because we've been losing money. And so what we've had to do is pull down from the checking account. Just like if you, on a, on a personal level, if you overspend, what do you have to do? Your savings account goes down because you're spending more than your paycheck is. And so we've gone from over $20 million to right now we're at $5.7 million. So in five years, we've, we've, subsidized, we've subsidized $15 million of our health insurance cost by, by using our fund balance. Okay? So now the, hey, the obvious issue that we have to deal with is, is twofold because on the, on the operating side, okay, we just got done with the, the big picture general fund budget. Okay, that's got a, a budget shortfall of, of $9 million in it. All the unknowns we still have, we're still working that piece. But that's one thing we're ultimately going to have to decide on 
in terms of for this year, when we come in June and say, here's the budget we're asking you to present, you're going to sort of have to tell us in terms of what, you know, when it comes to pay raises, all those sorts of things, what are you willing to, you know, provide because that's going to affect the, the cost. In terms of the, the medical contribution, what I, what I want to ultimately, per, you know, get us to is that we're sustainable, okay? So, absolutely, like I started, want to do everything we can for the employees, all that sort of thing. The balancing act is I want us as a district to have a sustainable thing. I mean, if, you, if you're spending your, your checking account down, there's only so much in that, and ultimately that's going to run out, and then, then you're in a world of hurt at, at that point. So I want a, us to develop the plan of what are we going to do so that on the health insurance side, we can sustain what we're doing, and on the general fund side, we can do a, we can do a, a, balanced, a balanced budget. So that's the, the high um, level and at, I guess at this point, I'll stop. If there's any questions for Rosanna and I, we'll, we'll address those now. And then after that, we'll turn it to, to Jared for him to present to you the, the medical update. Ms. Gonzalez. Oh, just a quick Sorry. question. I like that you included slide five. And that it's the, the I guess, the formula that TEA creates yes, that is for the administrative cost ratio. Mm -hmm. So then who codes it for the district? Is that our PEAMS department? Who actually codes instructional leadership? Who co codes administration? Uh, we do, the budget office, the finance office. If it's a position, uh, goes through HR, budget office gets involved in coding, coding positions at, the, at salary level. Now, expenditures related to con contracted services, supplies, that is at, uh, based on the campus and department allocations. Now, uh, finance is involved in workflow, so we review transactions as they come through so that they're coded properly and they, they are uh, appropriate for that particular function. So you said that that salary does is part of that equation as well. Of how Absolutely, coded? yes. Okay. It all goes through finance for review and and uh, and updating so that it's uh, allocated appropriately. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just had uh, so on this TASB study, are they just looking at teachers? I feel like we are using the microphone. We're right here next <laughs> to each other. Um, <laughs> are they just looking at teachers? Are they looking at other staff members? Is the comparison? I mean, how wide is the comparison, or how narrow is it? So um, just going to read a statement that we received, and actually, and that's just walking in, so that might be perfect timing. But um, so the, the district is engaged with consultants from uh, the Texas Association of School Boards, uh, HR Services Division, to con conduct comprehensive review of each employee compensation plan on a rotating basis. So these studies are conducted to objectively examine the competitive job market for Round Rock ISD and determine wi uh, whether pay practices are internally fair and externally competitive. So the ro there's a rotation cycle. So it began back in 2015-16, and uh, so back in 2015-16, uh, they looked at all professional and administrative certified educators, and they, uh, they created educator pathway groups, and they've been reviewed every cycle. So that the educator pathways uh, groups are looked at uh, every cycle, and they continue to strengthen the pathway and salary progression for educators over time. So the first wave was uh, for the professional administrative certified educators. 2016-17 was all non-exempt administrative instructional support and operation support personnel. Um, in 2017 18, it was postponed. The TASB study did not occur. So, this is the next round in 2018 19, which includes all professional and administrative business and operations personnel, including technology and educational interpreters. Okay. I, I just had a thought earlier when you said, you know, are, we are, it's a competition. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, it's not just a competition with our other districts. I mean, there's a lot of jobs, especially like if you're talking technology and things like that. I mean, so I hope when we look at things, we look a little broader than just our neighboring districts, even our, our comparative districts around the state, because especially here in Austin, our competition is a lot broader than that. Because, and, and I know people are leaving to go back to school and do other jobs. Um, so I'd like to keep some of those people. Mr. Math. Yes, on the uh, self-insurance, medical self-insurance, uh, it sounds like we drained about $15 million over the last, uh, what was it, four or five years. Uh, was that uh, intentional in that um, we just knew the subsidy was going on, but we didn't want to uh, increase the deductions from the paychecks? Or did medical costs uh, exceed what our expectations were? 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't hear. I don't, I don't know what the mindset. Um, um, actually, and I'm not. I, I, w- I wouldn't call myself the expert when it comes to um, benefits. Um, and we we do have Tanya Davis and. Uh, uh, if, Tony Davis is our director of payroll and benefits, and she has the history related to, to okay. those. Sure. Yeah, typically on self-insured plans, you estimate what your claim costs are going to be. And uh, really my question is whether our claim costs have been coming in higher uh, or Actually, or not. it's both. We wanted to use our fund balance um, so we wouldn't have to increase costs for the employee. We did have to increase deductibles and coinsurance over the years. And um, our costs have gone up, our claims cost, our prescription cost. Um, so we'll see all of that in the presentation that our insurance consultants will be providing in a few minutes. Okay. I'll be patient. Thank you. So um, we've got a question on page uh, 9, and this relates to what uh, Amy was saying just a minute ago. Uh, student enrollment growth is projected. This is Tim- Templeton Demographics. Is that right? That's correct. So we have an ongoing retainer with them. Is that right? And they give us a quarterly update based on um, – developers buying land plots uh undeveloped lots um the whole thing so this is this is uh their estimate but back to the competition uh a few years ago we went a group of us went and looked at the meridian charter school and then another group was uh, the same group went and looked at harmony i know there's a idea i think is coming to round rock isd and then there's gateway uh can we get I think because they are public schools, uh, at the time we did a request, a public information request on them, what were the zip codes of the children who were in their district? And at the time, I think we had roughly 5%, 4% or so. I don't know if we can do that again, but it would be kind of curious to see how many students who live in Round Rock ISD go to these charter schools. Now, of course, we, don't, we can't call parochial schools or any you know, home schools, but... Do you have anything on that? Person? No, we, we were able to get some of that before. What some of the charter schools have begun doing is that the parents can sign a form saying their information can't be released and then it's not accessible. So it's a little bit more, according to Templeton, it's a little bit more difficult to get than it used to be. Not that we can't get some of it, but I, I'm not assured that we could get all of it. Not even a zip code, not the address, just the zip code. I'd have to check with Templeton, but I know that was a, there were some barriers before. We were able to get some, but um, I think they were encouraging parents to... Well, I, they, I just remember going to Meridian. I think they had 1,200 students at the time, and half of those came from with Round Rock ISD students would normally go to Round Rock, and the others came from Georgetown, Pflugerville, anywhere in Williamson County, or Leander, Taylor, Hutto. So anyway, okay. Any other comments, Ms. Bessa? So um, back to the administrative cost ratio. Um, earlier this week I had asked you to um, – a little bit about the curriculum and staff development um, ratios um, and how ours compared to other districts similar to ours or neighboring us. Were you able to put that together? Um, we, we were able to, to look up some of the, that information. Uh, we've been working with uh, Mandy Estes and in, in the Chief of Teaching and Learning. And so uh, if there's a specific question related to, to the comparison or... I mean, I just wanted to see a similar, like you did with the administrative cost ratio, how you compared uh, our administrative cost ratio to other area neighboring districts and similar districts. I... I mean, I had done some research myself as I was looking at our budget situation and had seen some trends. So I just wanted to, for you guys, if we're going to do it on the administrative cost ratio, I just was looking at other ratios that might be significant in terms of comparisons. Okay, we have the data and we can provide that in, in an update. Well, I asked for it to be provided here. <laughs> I asked on Monday. So we, we have the data. It was, it, it just didn't have, we didn't have the time to put it in, in the actual presentation. And so um, we, can, we can certainly have that available to the board. I'm not happy with that response. I mean, I, could, I literally thought about, you know what, maybe I'll just put it together myself because it only took me like, I went through every single comparative district, just went to PEAMS, and looked it up like it's not hard it would have taken 30 minutes to do that and I actually thought about just doing it myself because just in case you didn't provide it but 
I can tell you, we are significantly higher than anybody. Well, is, it, is that something you can put together and give it to Dr. Flores and send it in tomorrow's or the board update? Because I'd like to see the comparison. Um, you know, we've, we've always, and I, I look at this one on page four, and of course, Austin and Georgetown jump out as more than twice, um, and even Pflugerville, that m almost more than, th those two are twice, twice of what we are. Uh, the cohort districts, Katy, Conroe, Plano, um, they've always been, and I don't know what their enrollment now is, but they were always a cohort district, meaning they were 10 or 15% of our enrollment, relatively the same demographics, um, things like that. So, um, you so know, be interested to see. If just, I have it right here in front of me. Just as, So we spend about 4.65% of our budget on curriculum and staff development. Leander spends 2.5% of their budget on curriculum and staff development. Eanes spends 2.73% of their budget. Conroe spends 0.98% um, of their budget. So those were just, I just did, I had a few pictures that I had taken when I initially done my research. So as you can see, I mean, we're spending, in most cases, double what other districts are spending on curriculum and staff development. So that's going to affect our administrative cost ratio because we're spending more on the denominator, considerably more. So do you want to talk about why we spend so much more than, I mean, because Leander basically is the same rated district. Eanes is an A-rated district. So it's not like we're talking about non-A-rated districts. They're, they're A-rated. Why are we spending so much more? So most of that um, ratio, and I would look to finance people to correct me if I'm wrong, is, is in the form of salaries. And so many of these were choices that the board has made in the past um, regarding um, staff. So you're looking at positions like instructional technology specialists, instructional coaches, academy specialists. You're looking at um, IB uh, coordinators on the campuses. Uh, those types of positions are included in, in that number. Um, so it's not, um, I don't want to give you the impression that it's, uh, we have, have uh, huge budgets that are amounting to that. Uh, in my opinion, and I would defer also to Dr. Presley on this, it's intentional choices that the, the board has made along the way for positions um, that support uh, campuses and support instruction, in some cases, on the campuses. Well, I mean, we're going to have to be making some budget decisions as to where we spend money. So let's just compare ourselves to Leander. They're a little smaller than us, also basically an A-rated district. I mean, they got an 89 and we got a 90, so, I mean, it's comparable. They're spending $8 million on curriculum and staff development, and we're spending almost 19. So that's a considerable difference. And, and so we need, as we go through this budget process, so the second question that I asked was, could you do a comparison on special ed spending? I assume that we don't have that either. <laughs> but I asked them of this on Monday. So let's just go through our special, you know what, I don't have that in these pictures. But I went through, um, maybe I do, hold on. Okay, so we spend on students with disabilities, we spend 16.34% of our budget. I couldn't find another comparable district that spent that low. Like it wasn't, I couldn't find it. There were some districts as low as maybe 18. Most were in the 20 range. So we're spending a lot less comparatively on special education programs and a lot more on curriculum and staff development. And, and that was a priority decision in terms of how we spend money. We spend less on special ed and more on curriculum and staff development. So we as a board just have to decide in this budgetary process like, where do we want to put our money? Do we want to move some money around to focus on, on certain areas that maybe we feel need to be beefed up? So I was going to say, if, 
if, if you have all of that, Mr. Moses, did you have something on that? I mean, again, I think those, those statistics are very interesting, but I want to be a little careful because I want, I want to know the details and the, some of that as well. Uh, you know, especially the special ed, I'd like to get some more information on that because I know there's some strategies that I'm sure we're, we're using that may be in part of that. So I want to get more, some more information on that at some point. But I think also the curriculum instruction, but, you know, the Mandy's point, you know, it's about, again, we, and it's a fair, I'm not saying it's not a fair conversation, it is, but it's just about how we want to best put our dollars to impacting student learning. And what the decision has been in the past is to have these people on site, on the campus, they can assist teachers. They can work with students individually as needed to to help drive uh, their achievement. So that's, again, I just want to be very careful about just painting broad brushes until we get And I know you've asked for it, and I think you, know, if you asked for it, you need to get it. But I think it just, I want to get that inf more information, more details before we well, start going too far down that road. I asked on Monday. So if that was the case, you know, they had, and I asked about these two specific areas. And if they wanted to make a case that that was the case, that, that we're just, and I, I mentioned that in my commentary, we may be utilizing instructional coaches rather than, and they're coded differently than special education instructors. But make that case to us. As we go down this budget road, make the case for why the current allocations are the best course for educating our student population. Because as I'm just doing a cursory glance, we're we're spending a lot more in one area and a lot less in another, and I want to know why, especially in light of um, just a lot of, I mean, a lot of focus this past year on special education and, and it not being, you know, as a state, us not measuring up in terms of meeting the, the needs of special education students. Um, and that was a whole big, you know... Um, so that, that's just something that I think that we as a board should definitely be laser focused on, that we're making sure that the way we're allocating money is meeting their needs. And whether, I mean, we, we could determine that continuing to utilize instructional coaches and um, staff development and things like that is the best course of action to meeting their needs. But we could also determine that it's not and that this is our this is our opportunity to make those allocation changes when we budget. No, I agree. I think those are, again, valid conversations to have. I just want to make sure that we have all the information to make those decisions. Not just, I just don't want to go just strictly see two numbers on a page and say, oh, hang on, that's more than that, and that's less than that, so we need to do this. I want to make sure we're pulling the levers in the right way that we don't inadvertently cause an issue somewhere else. I want to see, I'm, I'm just looking at your email again, Corey, here. And, and I think you have some points, but I do. I would like for us to put that together, the comments and uh, the numbers, and send what you have. But then we have. We've made decisions over the years to put more, um, more on-site, on-campus activity, but uh, this is a good time to, to bring it up. Did you have a well, kind of related I, question? Well, I just, first of all, thank you for doing all that work, um, um, looking up all that stuff for us and bringing it to our attention. I mean, I, I've also had some ideas about the way we sort of look at the budget because I don't really think in those big spreadsheets. But I'm actually just wondering if, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, when, when we get to the committee assignments in a little while, like finance, I mean, I feel like this would be a place where maybe we can take it offline a little bit and really dig into those numbers and then be able to come back and hopefully address, um, you know, what Mason is asking and then be able to bring it back to everybody. Fair enough. <clears throat> Fair enough. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments right now? Mason? Anything? Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you for right now. We may uh, stay, stay close because we're going to be, we can go sit down, but anyway, we're going to be going on our next ad agenda items, which are facility and finance committees, and then the other one will be policy. I, I actually, have a presentation. Jared needs to do the presentation. Oh, okay. Piece. All right. Jared? Good evening. Good evening. Is this, it's on. Okay. Uh, my name is Jared Moss, and I'm with Martian McLennan Agency here in Austin. 
And uh, with me is Erin Roman. She's our, my account executive for this account. And then Todd Patchback here also works with me <clears throat> as a consultant on your account as well. Uh, we've worked for Round Rock for the last six years. Uh, we also are the consultant for Leander and for Pflugerville and for Del Valley ISD here in town. And the only other one that we want is um, Lake Travis. Just saying. Okay, I'd like to go through the presentation uh, this evening, and uh, I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit quick, but please ask questions if you have any. Uh, the agenda, uh, we're going to talk about the, the current state of the health plan, the enrollment and the demographics, your current plan designs and employee contributions, and then compare you to local and peer districts. Uh, then we're going to talk about the performance of, of the plan over the last couple of years. And then the other plans that are offered, uh, the ancillary lines of coverage, dental, dental vision, life disability, and so on. So if you turn to the uh, first page, <clears throat> enrollment figures on page four, uh, this just gives you an idea of how many employees are covered, uh, what plans they're on. You currently offer three plans, the standard, intermediate, and premium. And it just gives you the, de the uh, deductibles. On the next page, you'll find more, more information on those. But in total, we cover 5,843 employees. <clears throat> and there's the percentage that are covered under each plan. You'll see that the majority of the folks are covered under the standard plan. And then the members down below, that signifies, we call those belly buttons. So that would be employees, spouses, and children. Uh, so a total of 8,769 members that we're covering on average this year. Okay. And then the demographics of the group, this is important to us. The average age of the group is 44.2. Uh, if you look nationwide, that average age is 42.9, so you're a little bit older than the average. Uh, and this is consistent with all schools. They all kind of run the same. Uh, the female-male ratio is 67 to 33%. And then below that, you'll see a comparison of risk to norm. So if we didn't know anything about you, we would anticipate or expect that you'd run 7% higher than the norm just because you have those two factors. Uh, you're a little bit older, and then females do tend to spend a little bit more than males do until age 58, and then we take over at that point. But, um, and this is common. Uh, all the schools that we handle, these numbers are almost identical. Okay. So page five, this gets into the specific benefits of each plan, and then the, uh, what the employees pay <clears throat> by tier, by employee. Employee only, children, spouse, and family. So you still have a zero cost plan that's offered to your employees, and that's where the majority of your employees are covered. Okay. And then if we compare you to uh, uh, Austin ISD, Leander ISD, Fleurville, <clears throat> this gives you a, an idea of not only the district contribution, but how the plans look and then how the employees participate from their standpoint. And just a, a note, a question came in from a board member as to, so the rates that you see here under the premiums, those are monthly rates. Okay. Yeah, and, and just so you know, um, Austin ISD, Pflugerville, and Leander offer high deductible health plans. If you look under Leander, you'll see CDHP, that's a consumer-driven health plan. Same as a high deductible, it's just that's what they call it. So if you went and looked at their net, on their <coughs> um, site, website, that's the name that you'd see. But it's, it's a, an HSA plan. Round Rock currently does not offer one. That's something that we're looking at, you know, potentially for this coming year. A health savings account. Yeah. It's very popular. And, uh, you know, I think we would look at it. Again, this is something we'll be talking about, but add it as another option to your employees. And then we're also comparing you to TRS Active Care. And the employee contributions under TRS, we have no idea because those are the rates that the schools are charged. Every school in TRS has a different way that they charge their employees, and that's something we don't have access to. Okay. And then as far as your annual contribution on page 9, uh, this just gives you the different school districts and what their annual contributions to the health plan are. And then peer districts, you'll see those noted as well. And then we've noted which ones are self-funded and which ones are 
well, the TRS, obviously, they're in TRS, so it's more of a fully insured environment for them, but all of the others are self-funded. And then this is employee contributions. This just shows you all the plans that have a $0 cost to the employee. Okay, so let's talk about the health performance of the plan. So a lot of numbers on this page, but we went back to 2015-16 plan year. And so at the top, you'll notice the number of employees <clears throat> and the number of members. And so you'll see the growth uh, year over year. A little bit negative for last year. Uh, we do anticipate a little bit of growth back this year for the 2018-19 projection. And then you'll see the total claims paid. <clears throat> And we put right below that, you'll see the 315.61 for the 2015-16 year. We show that as a, that PMPM is a per member per month because as you grow, you want to make sure those are consistent numbers. So you'll see year over year how that cost. And these are just the claim side of it. This does not include any retention, which would be what Blue Cross charges you to administer the plan, the stop loss involved that protects you in the event of large claims, their network, and all of the what we call the fixed cost side of it. This is just pure your claims. And then you'll see what we project for this year for the 2018-19. And one note, if you'll look down at the pharmacy year over year, you'll notice in red, uh, one of the things that we did last year is we changed from Blue Cross's PBM, their pharmacy benefit manager, to an outside, uh, we, what we call in our business, we carved it out because we could find a lot better pricing. And so you'll notice that cost went down from ten million five eighty seven to nine million thirty four, even though we increased in the population. And so that's a savings of you know about one point five million dollars. And just a comment, and we'll talk more about the self funding versus fully insured. But if you fully insured, that goes away, because now the if you're with a carrier fully insured, they don't let you do that. That's one of their big profit levers. That's where they make a lot of money. And by carving out, we're able to push a lot of the rebates that come from the pharmacy manufacturers to you as opposed to, to the insurance company. And so that's, that's where that savings comes from. Um, and it's not noted in the 2018-19, but that contract, we got a $500,000 better contract for this coming year. So, And that's not reflected in that number yet. But um, again, this is the value of being able to carve out and get a much better deal than you could through the insurance carrier. <clears throat> on page 13, this is the, the prescription drug analysis. These are the exact same numbers. The only thing I wanted to note in here for you guys is uh, the number of scripts dispensed. So these are the number of 30-day supplies, the scripts for 30-day supplies. So you can see for this last year, 112,000. So I just thought you'd find that an interesting number. That's a lot of scripts that are going out. And again, nothing out of the norm. It's what we'd anticipate uh, for a group your size with your demographics. Okay, on page 14, uh, what this illustrates, um, in the blue, that is Round Rock's cost per employee per year. So that's all in. That includes your claims, your fixed cost. Again, that's the administration of the plan, the stop-loss coverage. Everything that Blue Cross charges you to administer your plan is in that number. And so if an employee asks you, what does it cost per year to provide us coverage, that's what that number reflects. Okay. Now, if you'll notice the, in the red, those are employee premiums. So we take all of the employee contributions, we divide it by the number of employees in the year, and so you'll see how that's increased. It was pretty much the same for the last two years, and this year it bumped up to 1,844. The employee benefit payments, that's what the employees spend out of pocket for, deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, anything that they, when they go to a provider they pay for, that's what's in that number. And not reflected on here, but I would, I would just tell you that if I looked over the last 10 years, Round Rock's cost has been fairly flat. The employees portion has gone up by almost, I think, 55% over that 10-year span. So, you know, the cost of the plan has gone up, but most of that cost has been pushed to the employee side of the equation. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So one of the big questions that we've been asked is self-funding versus uh, fully insured. And I'd like to skip this page and go to the next one because I think we can 
there's a lot more detail here as to how. <clears throat> so let me let me just a real quick comment on fully insured and self-funding. Both of them have two components, and they're exactly almost exactly the same. You have your fixed costs, which I talked about. That's what the insurance company charges you to administer the plan. They do the same thing in a fully insured environment, same thing in the self-funded environment. It costs more in the fully insured because there's some profit in there. So you're going to have probably about a 2% differential higher that they're going to charge you on the, on the fully insured versus the self-funded side. <clears throat> I would tell you right now, you're, the other side of that is your claims. And the claims are going to be the same whether you fully insure or you self-fund. Okay? When Blue Cross projects what your claims are going to be, it's the same, exact same number on both sides of that equation. The difference is what they charge on the fixed cost side. So right off the bat, you're talking anywhere from 1% to 3%, depending on who the insurance company is, that they're going to charge you more on the fully insured side. Uh, <clears throat> there's also a risk charge of 2%, that, uh, and that's an estimate that carriers charge to give you that cap on your fully insured rate. So that's another 2% more that you're going to pay that you would not under self-funded plan. And then when you add the drug side in, you're going to, on average, save, or you're, you would pay more, 7% more, to be fully insured than you would be to be self-funded. So if I look at your projection for next year of your total cost of, of $40 million, uh, that's about almost $3 million that you would pay an additional cost to be fully insured. Uh, at your size, employers never fully, I'm not going to say never, I would say very rarely because the economics of it just do not work. Uh, the insurance companies want to make a profit. In a self-funded plan, we have really done this to that profit of, of ability for them to do. So, And being able to carve out and do different things, the stability. You guys have been with Blue Cross for, uh, this is, I think, year 10. You would never do that in the fully insured world. You'd be flipping back and forth a lot because if your rate's not good, what's your option? You have to change to another carrier. And so... I would just tell you that uh, I've done this, this is year 41. Um, it just makes sense. It's the most efficient way to do your health plan. And that's, a, that's an absolute, it just is. Okay. Any questions on that side of it? And then I think we've already touched on, this is the uh, fund balance. <clears throat> And I'm sure most of you know the 370 that Round Rock uh, currently puts into the plan per employee, that number has not changed in a long, long, long time. It actually went down for a couple of years, then popped back up to the 370, but it has not changed. And <clears throat> that's one of the reasons that you're seeing this fund balance, because that number has never changed. Okay, I'm going to let Aaron talk about your other uh, benefits. Good evening. Um, I'm just going to run through the additional benefits that are offered to employees. Um, I also want to note that these benefits right now are out to RFP. Um, those bids were due back this week, so we're starting the process of, of analyzing those. Um, we have two truckloads full of boxes yes. of responses. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Um, so this is going to be an opportunity potentially for carrier changes or, or plan changes, um, obviously looking to better the rates because um, with the exception of basic life coverage for the employees, these are coverages that the employees pay for in total. Um, so the dental is currently with United Healthcare. Um, it does have a PPO network for the in-network level. Um, any out-of-network uh, Claims actually go to what's called a maximum allowable charge. Um, so it's a pretty standard dental plan with a $50 deductible per year. Um, there's a max per family of three times that. Um, each person in the family can spend up to $12.50 uh, per year on their dental expenses. Um, and then there's coinsurance depending on the type of service that you have. Um, there is orthodontic coverage, but it's for children only. Um, vision is currently through Superior Vision. Um, the rates are listed on this slide. Um, again, fully funded by the employees. Um, a, a fairly standard vision plan. Um, you can get your exam and lenses, that's contact lenses or glass lenses, um, once every year, and frames are once every other year. 
Um, exams cost the members $10. Um, frames are a $20 copay, plus they get $130 allowance. So after that, um, they have to pay the difference. Um, again, the, the copays for the lenses um, and contact lenses as well. Um, disability is currently with Sun Life. Um, there's two plan options that employees can choose from. This is a little bit different than some of your standard voluntary disability plans. Um, they have option one. Both options are a bundled short-term disability and long-term disability plan. Um, so option one has a shorter elimination period. So if they're disabled um, at least 14 days, a benefit begins to pay. Um, for the first um, several months, they're in that short-term disability period. Um, and then they move into, if they continue to be disabled, into long-term disability. The major difference is how the benefits are paid out. On short-term disability, benefits are paid out weekly. On long-term disability, they're paid out monthly. So when they transition, it's just a difference in how they're paid and how often they're paid. Um, but essentially, the benefit, they get up to 60% of their income, up to $5,000 per month. Um, and with option two, it works exactly the same way, but they have to be disabled for at least 90 days before a benefit starts to kick in. Um, life and accidental death and dismemberment are with Minnesota Life currently. Um, there is an employer paid benefit for all eligible employees. Um, it's $10,000 for life and AD and D. Employees can choose to purchase additional life and, sh life and ADD coverage for themselves um, and their spouses or children. The guaranteed issue amount is um, the amount that the employee can elect without having to provide any um, medical evidence of insurability. Um, additional benefits offered. All eligible employees are offered an employee assistance program that is paid for um, by the district, actually through the Blue Cross admin fee. That's part of that fee. Um, there are face-to-face -face visits um, per issue, so it's really for a life and work balance if an employee is having an issue. Um, there's essentially a hotline or a counselor they can see through this EAP program. Um, there's also um, a flexible spending account for health care and dependent care. So essentially you set aside pre-tax dollars into an account to subsidize your expenses for medical, dental, or vision, um, or for daycare for those employees that have kids um, in daycare. Minnesota Life, as part of your basic life, um, offers an additional EAP service. It's unlimited telephonic guidance. Um, they also offer a travel assistance benefit and some legacy planning. So there's some beneficiary services in the event if someone were to pass away. Questions? Mr. Math. Yes, um, we had heard in a prior presentation that one of the ways that we keep employees happy is to provide benefits and keep the cost of benefits down. And I'm always looking for ways to give more for less. Um, I didn't see anything in the medical plans that uh, promote uh, wellness and, and those sorts of healthy lifestyles. Um, medical plans that I'm familiar with uh, might have different rates for smokers versus non-smokers. Um, there's uh, biometric testing that, that happens, HDL, LDL, pulse, glucose, uh, all those things. Um, subsidy or payment for weight loss programs. Is, is that something that we can take advantage of, and to what extent are other districts or other medical plans doing that? <clears throat> yes, you can. Uh, all of these have been talked about. They've just not been really acted upon. So there's a lot of different things that are available to employees. Wellness plans, there's opportunity there. Um, Blue Cross has wellness plans. There's a lot of other outside vendors that offer wellness plans. There's all kinds of things that are available. It's just this was, I don't want to go backwards, but um, <clears throat> these are things that we'll talk with Kenneth and his group going forward that, uh, you know, we believe have value and, and can hopefully change outcomes. When you change people's outcomes, then cost goes down. So, yeah, there's a lot of things available that uh, strategies and things that we, you know, we want to bring to the table. Yeah, I've seen companies that have implemented some of these um, 
wellness programs that have really had a marked decrease in mm-hmm. claim costs and ultimately premium that gets passed down to the employees. Right. So there's only so many places to cut, and if there's an opportunity to uh, cut costs there, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Moses. Thank you, Mr. President. Do we offer anything like, like teledoc or telemedicine? Is that a part of any of the plans? Um, not currently. It has been discussed. It's on the table. Great. <laughs> that, this, if y'all want, no, no, that basically means they can call in from home and talk to a doctor instead of them go sit in the waiting room and do all that, which could help keep some of those costs down as well, which is, and this is a great benefit to have, especially if you have little ones who are sick and you don't want to go sit in a doctor's office with other sick families. Great. I've had that, the last, I've used it a couple of times where you just dial in and they have different variations. So mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the trend is going forward. So at least for basic, you know, and, and at least initial, oh, yeah. but, you know, so some stuff you got to go, <laughs> but if yeah, you, sure. but you, if you yeah. know you yeah. have the yeah. flu and you don't need to go to doctor's that's office, right. you can just call and get the meds and go from yeah. there. Uh, and then Kenneth, yeah. I just had a question for you on page 18. It goes back to our, our fund balance on this. What are some, I don't want to get too far ahead, but what are some strategies, some strategies or ideas that we can ex, you know, expect to come to help sure that up? Because when I saw this slide in, in preparation, I was like, yeah, that, I don't like that trend. <laughs> and I know you don't either. So, right, but, right. Yeah. yeah. No, and it, it literally is the, the, the you know, I've worked as a backdrop. I've worked with Jared my whole time in, in Pflugerville. And like Jared described, there are a lot of, there are a lot of dials that you can, can turn and, and hopefully get, you know, good, good outcomes, had, had that experience at, at Pflugerville. So I think it, when, it, when you boil it all down, we've got to do sort of like, it's kind of like one of three things, if not a combination of them. The choices are, do you change the, do you change the plan? Do you do the teledoc? Do you do those kind of things that could potentially lower your costs so you don't need as much money to, to do it because you've, you've done that? That's the best option. Then it becomes... A deal of does the district contribute more and have to factor that into you know what is what does it cost and is the board willing to adjust that and that's kind of like I need y'all to, to tell me what you, what you're comfortable with yeah I'll get you as current of a price tag of okay what is what would that what would that do on the operating side to our general fund if we increase the employee contribution the the third piece would be do we do we take it from the employees paycheck I mean those are those are really where we're at so like I said work with Jared a long time I absolute going to work with them again, look forward to what we can do to, we're just looking for a way to, to change the, we've got to change the needle. I mean, we can't stay like, like this. And then it becomes just a balancing act of you have two funds. And so, you know, if we, if we pay more out of the general fund, then we've got to address the general fund and, and, and get that. So it, it's all connected. Ms. Weir? I, I don't even, I'm not quite sure what my question is. So if, if we're not going to go the, the, even look at fully insured, then it sounds like really the only way we can make things better for our teachers. And, and, and we've heard, those of us that ran, I will tell you a lot about the prescriptions. People were, there are people that aren't getting their medication, don't, their medication isn't covered. Um, so that, that's a concern. You know, the cost that, that we had fewer participants in 17, 18, but yet their cost went up, both out of pocket and their deductible. Is, is alarming. And I actually went through, I, I was just kind of curious what other state employees, I mean, my husband is at UT, so I, I knew what UT's plan was, and I also looked at ERS compared to TRS and compared to what, um, you know, we're providing. And, and it's, I mean, there the state is putting a lot more money in, but, I mean, for all of the ERS plans, full-time employees plus family, the most expensive one is $615 to the employee. And ours is 1500 And, you know, I think about custodians in particular. You know, if you're making $10 an hour, $13 an hour, you can't cover your kids. And, and some of our teachers are in that same boat. And so... To be fair, they would be covered by CHIP. Yeah, because they're <laughs> below the... I mean, yeah. and that's a whole other issue, right? Because they're below the poverty line um, and working full-time. But... So, but even our teachers, right? I mean, it, it's just, it, it's very concerning to me. And, and I guess when I asked about the fully insured, I was wanting to look at it from, say, the teacher's perspective. You know, it's going to cost us more money, really, to help them. So if from their side, 
we could get something better and it's going to cost us more anyway. I mean, I guess I just want to find a really a solution to, to this issue because it is a huge issue. And, and, and we heard it a lot on the campaign trail and, and, and it's a problem. And, and we're not, I feel like, you know, like I said, I don't think we're just competing. I mean, people are leaving to go to these other jobs because they do just, just for the health care. They're going back to school. I mean, I know ACC is now going to drop their student health care, but up until this year in August 19 when they drop it, we had teachers and paras taking classes at ACC because their student insurance was better than what we're offering. So, I mean, we just have to do better in this regard. And I don't know. I mean, and hopefully that's something we can work with y'all about, but we, we have to do better in this regard. Yeah, yeah I would just say that the... Again, when I look at fully insured versus self-funded, I look at the the top line cost because that's the at the end of the day that's what all, and one's going to cost seven percent more. Uh, being fully insured does not give you any other advantage of because if my cost is this, then I'm going to pass so much of that to the employee, and then the rest I'm going to pay for. Now, one of the other negatives of being fully insured is the 370 you pay. That's going to change, and they dictate what you pay because either you pay it or the employee pays it. Here, it, I would just tell you, and you'll have to trust me, <laughs> it just works better. And it's always going to be less expensive, always. If I look at a 10-year timeline, uh, self-funding works 100% of the time. Not 99%, 100% of the time it will outperform fully insured. It just does. Because carriers, they have a profit <coughs> built in, and we're taking a lot of that profit out of the equation. And it's not something they can earn back. It's gone. And so... And the fact that we can carve out the PBM and do those kind of things, which are direct dollars back to the district and to the employees, you know, that's, that's what makes this work. Um, I would just tell you that, you know, when you look at rates from other companies, uh, it's a matter of the employer subsidizing a bigger piece of the pie, and so that's what dictates that. Um, it's, it's not that their plan's better, it's just the employer puts more money into the pot. So that's what makes those rates lower. Okay, Mr. Uh, I think Ms. Vesa, then Mr. Moses. Moses. So, I mean, what Amy's talking about is more in terms of making our plan more generous so that they have fewer out-of-pocket expenses. But to just put it in perspective, we're bleeding 3 to $4 million out of our fund balance every year. So that means that our contributions are under what we need by three to four million dollars every year. So that's just keeping pace with what we currently have, not increasing benefits. So we know that in order to stop this downward cycle, we need to add in three to four million dollars a year. So that's in addition to, like when you said the things that aren't in our deficit, we're, we're just right now saying, okay, we need three or four million dollars of our general fund budget to go into this um, this health plan, or else we're going to go insolvent, basically, within like two years. So that's that's there. So then there's the other problem of like, well, okay, our benefits are poor, so let's beef them up, right? That's the desire. Well, we're already spending three to four million dollars just to say solvent. So now we're talking. I don't even know how many million dollars more to increase our, you know. And so that goes back to my constant refrain of we need the legislature to allocate more money for public education because we can't survive. We're, our, we're, we're just, we're bleeding in red. And, um, yeah. Like we need we need to allocate more money from our general fund towards our teachers. We need to beef up their benefits. We need to pay them more. This is compounding. Okay, it's great that we, you know, um, look like we're going to have a deficit of ten million dollars less than we expected in January. But when we talk about having competitive salaries in a an environment where our unemployment rate in this area is under 3%. When we talk about our benefits and what we need to do to shore up the system and stay competitive, it's just, 
we're, we're not spending enough in special education. I mean, like, it's the, the costs just keep going up. So out there, if you're watching, please <laughs> advocate at the legislature that we really, really, really need school finance reform. We really, really need the legislature to step up. And as we were talking before about HB3, it's a substantial amount more money that we would get. It would help a lot to alleviate these budget concerns. So go HB3. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Moses. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, and I think just, again, just adding a little bit of a context kind of historically, you know, because this is something that we've discussed at the board level for I mean, the last few cycles I've gone through on this is what we can do. And this is, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not advocating for one way or another, but I am saying what we've done is always put what we could into the, into the salaries. Because I know that doesn't always help whenever the premiums go up, but the thought is at least for those teachers who are getting near the end of their careers, it counts towards their retirement pension. We're giving so, a two percent well, increase a year. Like, course, I mean, it's hardly more than they would have otherwise. It's not. If we didn't give them it, they would be we'd be giving them a pay cut because of inflation. Well, yeah, I mean, we had to do that. Like, to to call our salary increases a salary increase. That's not what they were. They were an adjustment for inflation. So, I mean, I I, I disagree with that. That we decided to spend the money in. That's what salary. we decided, Corey. I mean, but we didn't give them a pay raise. So teachers out there, we didn't give you a pay raise. We gave you a cost of living adjustment so that you didn't get paid less. And then you paid more out of pocket in your um, health benefits. So did you even get any? I'm sorry. I was, I, was, I was talking. I got cut off there. But the decision was rather do that and make sure they could keep up that cost of living adjustment, raise, whatever you want to call it, or put over here in the benefits where they don't recognize that for their TRS. So I'm, I'm not saying one way is better than the other. I'm saying that's what we chose to do because we thought that was going to give the greater benefit over the long term. We done this for they want we can decide to change our mind if we want. I'm just I was just trying to find some context for where that number why that number is what it is. And I was just trying to provide some context to our teachers out there that hey y'all we know that you didn't get a raise. And we know that this this is that you're you need raises and I'm trying to put in perspective the absolute necessity of school finance reform. Because if we do not get more additional funds, it's just not it's not sustainable. It wasn't sustainable before and it's not sustainable now. So you know what's ironic is is we've been in uh very Round Rock has been in great shape for so many years, and it's everybody's now starting to feel it. And and I'm glad that it's starting to get more visibility. And you're right, the uh, the state has uh, has an obligation to step up. I think they're doing better, but we have a long way to go. And it's it's a whole public. I think across the nation, it's not just Round Rock. It's certainly within Texas. We all have these issues, but we have been doing what we can as far as raises without going uh, depleting all of our fund balance. And and I, and I do remember you brought that up in the past about the TRS. It was better for us to do a raise than because it would it contributed better to the TRS in the long run. Ms. Gonzalez. So I mean, there's no doubt that in the state of Texas that our teachers are under underpaid. It, you couldn't be a single parent and raise three kids on what teachers make. And I just want to be clear. And we did give a two percent increase. This board decided to. We, we could have been like other school districts and made the decision to give no raise. But that, that was a decision, and we will look at it again. This entire board will, and we'll make a decision. I actually nearly made Randy fall out of his seat. I said, let's look at a 10%, and he didn't, <laughs> he didn't know what to say. I won't say that to you, I promise. But that's what they deserve. There's no doubt. So I'll get back to my question. On slide 18, when we talk about this, this fund balance, where does this fund balance come from? Is it, is it a set aside just for health care? Yes, it's literally its own fund that just deals with the self-insured medical program. So does any money go into it at any time? The, the money that flows in is what the employee contributes and the $370 that the district contributes. That's the, that's the money that comes into it. So, but there is money that it's just not enough to sustain. 
Well, it's, it's literally, I mean, the reason for the decline is that the revenue that came in from the district's contribution of 370 and what the employee put, there were simply more costs for the doctor visits and for the prescriptions than what was coming in. So anytime more comes in than goes out, that's, the, that's just a saving, all that is is a savings account. And when you spend more or each year, it, just it goes depletes. down. It's as simple as that. Okay, thank you. So it seemed like Randy gave a presentation at one point and said there were some high cost um, claims. And so all of those come right out of this, is that right? Or is that what you were talking about earlier, the, the stop gap? Right, the, the stop gap that Jared referenced, and I don't know if the current year number is 400,000. I think the year before it was 300,000. So the way self-insured insurance works is that as a district, we're self-insured. If I got very sick, okay? Cancer district, or whatever. Cancer, yeah, million dollars. Something, something significant, okay? The district's fund is going to incur up to the limit. So if it's 300,000, then the first 300,000 literally comes out of our savings account, comes out of, that's a cost the district's going to incur. Beyond that is literally the proverbial, I bought insurance. So if it's above that, and Mandy is my insurance carrier, she's paying that cost. And so that's the division. So we're paying a premium for that coverage. So the first 300,000 or wherever we pick that cutoff point is, that all is on us. Beyond that, the insurance carrier covers that. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, I hadn't heard you mention an in-network or out-of-network feature or PPO-type feature. Do, do we have any of that in place? Uh, yes, your three plans right now are PPO plans, so it does have in-network and out-of-network. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Ms. Feller. So I did listen online while I was okay. gone. Okay. Um, but this new information about the 300000 limit, is that per incident, per employee, per year? So if we had a bus full of 50 teachers going to a conference and they were all in a terrible car accident, 300000 for each of them, all 50 of them on the bus, or... How does that tell me? Tell me just a little bit more about how that maximum amount works. And I think the, the piece there, you, you bring in another, you bring in another variable with the bus accident because then it could be, you know, who is driving the bus and is there an insurance? You know, who is at fault with the accident? So you might have a that would be a whole different legal question there. But so that I'm getting it right from the expert, Jared, is that per occurrence or is that in a it's, year's time? It's per year, per plan year, per person. Yeah, per member, per plan year. So it's okay. 400000 currently. So the first 400000 comes out of your fund. Anything over that for the whole year go, comes from the stop-loss carrier, provides that coverage. Um, on average, how many employees do we have that hits that stop gap? So if we were so, to lower it... We, so we look at that every year, and we have the most efficient number for you. So... I would tell you that uh, 400000 for a group your size and your demographics, that's the number that makes the most sense. Okay. You can take it down, but it's going to cost you more. You're going to save less. Uh, again, we run this every year. It's something that we do for all okay. of our clients. And look, at, look at slide 12. Dr. Presley just pointed this out. That's similar to what I was asking for earlier and similar to what your slide 12 at the bottom of that. The number of claims over $100,000, bottom, bottom line there, bottom row. Yep. So. Okay. But that's some of those could be two hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's always the that's the biggest driver of cost, large claims. I mean, it's not the little dollars; it's the big ones. Mm -hmm. And a stat for all of you is seven percent of your members drive seventy percent of the cost. That's why most people don't don't understand why health insurance costs so much because it's the few that drive that big number. And and again, that's consistent with most groups. Seven percent drive seventy percent. Yeah. I actually just had one, and and this may not even be possible. But did districts ever get to? I mean, join so that they have more TRS. Um, well, well, yeah, but I mean, separate from like if if we like wanted to say go to co -op? talk, yeah, do a co op with say Fleurville or Leander, and we said, hey, we can get a better rate if we all three. I don't know. Is that, I mean, I don't even know what the logistics are legal. It, it just. So I would crazy. tell you that was tried a lot of times in the past. And what happens is if, let's say, you have five districts that combine or three, um, 
one of them has a bad year, which impacts the other two, which have good years, and then guess what? Those two leave, and this one gets stuck, and it, it, it's never worked in a way that was, that, yeah. Unless you can make them all stay together, and then, of course, that's what TRS is. That's what they did. So that's, that, that's an interesting scenario. I, I didn't know if TASB has. They have risk management, but they don't have anything for health insurance, do they? Yeah. So. But 77 or 7 percent, that's like an 80-20 rule, almost kind of analogous to that. So, yeah. um, All right. Any other questions, comments for now? This is an ongoing process. We'll, we'll get more info later or more details. So, All right. With that, let's take a quick break, and then we'll go to these committee uh, discussions. So it's uh, 7.35. We'll take a quick break. Uh, oh, he's gone. So we're back. Oh, that's right. He's gone. All right. So I was waiting for Mason. I forgot he's gone. All right. So we'll get back to a uh, call to order here, 749. And uh, Mr. Moses has stepped out. So um, with that, now we'll go to the Facilities and Finance Committee. And related to that, in a moment, we'll go to the Policy and Innovation. But right now it's uh, E3. So let me pull that up. Okay, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not seeing anything in here, so. Yeah, we had it on an email. Okay. All right, so let me just give you my background on this, um, because uh, right now, uh, Nikki, I think, and I are the only two that have experienced, have, have experience with the committees. We did them for a while. And then um, we kind of we have them in our policy. It's not required that we use them, but we're going to try it uh, for a bit. For the main reason is um, is to try to get some things done in a more uh, expedite some of the decisions that need to be made. Decisions aren't made in committee uh, in these committees. They're not binding for the board by any means. But uh, the committees that are formed do the research and bring the data back to the uh, the full board with a recommendation and uh, and some ideas, suggestions. And uh, as you see down here, it says the purpose is to review and advise on effective utilization of current, this is for the facilities committee, current facilities, review the progress of facility projects, advise on department of facilities planning and proce planning processes and timelines, review and advise funding priorities for facility projects, receive and review facilities proposals from departments and program areas, review and advise on future district facility needs, and then review and, and advise on long-term budgetary and financial issues. So you can see there's a lot of overlap with, with this committee and then even the, um, um, you know, even in a way we could say it, it, it does touch policy and innovation, which we'll talk about in a minute, but our whole purpose of this is to try to get things done in a more, because it's hard for us to get together as seven trustees and get things done. Um, I always thought that was the, one of the main areas. And then um, go dig deep uh, with uh, staffers on particular topics and bring those back to the full board. So anyway, the committee members, and I can't even remember when we had, I know we adopted this 2017, December um, we one day, and I think it was maybe 2016. We had like a seven-hour meeting where we tweaked a lot of the, the policy, the board operating procedures and policy, and some of this. A lot of it was just word cleanup, and um, so now we are in this area. So with that, what I we have a chair, board member, two board members, superintendent liaison, and then the um, uh, superintendent and board president are ex officio, meaning we will drop in. We may be there but we're not going to participate yes Any, this is free format right now just jump in right now this is that okay well i i specifically have a question about the facilities and finance charter that's in here um when you're looking at the the bullets that you read um the first one two three four five six um seem to be really facility driven but then when you get to the last line when it talks about review and advise on long-term budgetary and financial issues it feels like that is a different kind of committee. It feels like that is a budget committee. Um, and so I feel like that last bullet under that 
charter could possibly be an outlier to especially as an outlier to the to the agenda and the, the vision for this this committee, especially as we're entering this phase of massive projects. I mean, you know, you know that I served on the Citizens Bond Committee, and one of the things that was cons consistently said to the leadership team is the number of projects that you guys are proposing is astronomically higher than has ever been proposed in the past. And so I, I like the idea, I mean, I love the idea of this facilities committee, and I'm very passionate about it, having spent so much time on the bond committee. But I feel like when you add that last line in, it almost could muddy the discussion and the progress that we're hoping to make as a facilities committee in really planning for the bond projects and the process and all of the things that are coming up. Does that make sense? Does anybody it, else I, have I, any I, I totally of the same see concerns? That. It, it's too broad. Would it help if it was more narrow as it like add to the end as it pertains to facilities? That way it's a clear direction that we're not going to just be talking about any type of budget I issue. It's got to be clear that we're talking about facilities and budget. It has to tie together. I could see how that would definitely narrow the scope, that if we needed to talk about, you know, land purchases or, um, you know, long-term you know, long issues as it relates to our facilities for sure, that that would need to be addressed in that budgetary process. So that could possibly, and, and I don't know if I really even came with a solution. It just, it seemed like an outlier to that, and I just, with all of the budgetary concerns that we're facing and, and even the unknowns at, until this legislative session is over. Um, well, if you look at all the other bullet points, they all have the words, word facilities facility. in it. Mm -hmm. And we would probably have to propose that policy change, right, since this is in our operating procedures and we would have to vote on it. Is that right? That, that's what I was just going to ask, but I don't know if, Marty, if you're Marty? handling that for us today. But So if we wanted, <laughs> under up. the charter right here, the last bullet point talks about review and advise on long-term budgetary and financial issues. If we wanted to change that as it relates to facilities, we would need to put an action item to change this since it's part of our operating procedures. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so. And, I, and I, again, I'm, this is just my opinion. Okay. I wanted to propose right. it to the board before we even picked committees because I'll be real honest, it makes a difference in which committee I want to serve on. Okay. Well, um, right. Well, right. again, I'm going to give you my summary. I don't want us to be so narrow. And I know this happened with the, and you were the coach, you were the chair, I was of, the chair the of the district, district wide district wide committee. And I sat in on several of the meetings that you were conducting and the renewal, R&R, &R, and then the um, growth. growth. And I sat in, and sometimes they would get a discussion would be started, and then it would say, whoa, that's beyond our charter. That's beyond our scope. And in a way, I kind of want this, these committees, this is, these are predominantly made up of board members and staffers, is if you see something that overlaps, um, discuss it, bring it up. It doesn't mean you have to come forward and you can't touch it because it's not spe specifically spelled out here. But we are so, well, this is all intertwined. And a lot of it came up with the bond study committee was well, why don't you put roofs and replacement and things like that on, on the M&O budget? Why in a bond? And there was some discussion on that. And then said, well, that's not our scope. But even though we kind of related yeah. to it. So that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I meant like having a discussion about recapture over the next three years shouldn't necessarily, or to, in my opinion, shouldn't happen in a facilities committee. And so that's why. And yeah, because I, mean, I said it earlier, and, and that's what, I mean, I think that's where that's coming from. And, and you're right. I mean, it doesn't say it in there. It's almost like we would need... If we really wanted to dive deep into the budget, a need budget a committee, budgets, a completely separate budget committee to really go over all of those things that are going to be yeah. coming from your office versus the things that are going to be coming from Terry's office. And I would, I would actually really support that. I think a budget committee, just budget, would be really good. Okay, so we've got a couple, and this is pretty free format here at this point, if that's all right. So. 
if you well, piggyback on to what somebody said, just go ahead and, and then, but I do have some comments on it. So make it quick and we'll I'll get to my points. So on the policy committee, um, a lot of our policies pertain to how we're going to budget. I mean, maybe it makes more sense to put the the um, Can you give long term me, give me by, an example of like okay, what you, so so say we decide even just tonight, like we look at. I was talking about utilizing um, right now. We're, we're utilizing a lot of staff development and coaches, yep, and um, rather than maybe spending money in other ways in special education. Right. Well, that's kind of a policy discussion in terms of like where would you say that is or well, is I don't there know. an existing policy about Maybe that? not. Yeah, I, I to me that's no. more of like getting into the nuts of bolts of that's how that's we're going to spend our to money staff, okay. and that's not versus, what we do. Okay. All right. So maybe 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 it is that just a separate one. Um I I do have one question of clarification on the first bullet. Well, hold on, before you go on on that, does anybody have any other comments on the last bullet as to if we want to propose an action item to change this charter in the future to that it only is budgetary issues as it relates to facilities or do we want to propose a separate budget committee? Uh, that that one bullet point really <coughs> sticks out to me. I, I guess I... And since we have a meeting coming up in two weeks, you know, maybe we could put either take that off or add the word facilities. But I do think maybe we need to create a third committee if that's something that we feel we need to we, get into. We, we, we were just talking about that. So we used to have a policy, uh, facilities, and, and innovation. A, they, that's what they were called. We kind of reworked them. Again, we can create as many, we can use them, we can wave them, set them aside. The whole point is to expedite the whole process where we have people who are digging a little bit deeper on the on topics, bring it back to the full board. And then I, yeah, it. I just think I agree with Amber in that we could get too broad, and then we're not coming back with anything concise okay. to the board. Yep. So if we, if we pulled and sort it, of Terry's department over as facilities, and then if we do want to talk about budget, that's almost, because to have both of them in the same committee is, that's huge. Well, right? and yeah. it's a waste of resources if we're talking about budget, and he's just sitting there listening to budget discussion, thinking, okay, I've got all this other work to do. So Right, I, and we're not talking about some of the bond stuff that's yeah. coming up. I, I agree. I mean, yeah, really I wanted to chime in with something. Use of people's it's hard time. to get a <laughs> word in here. <laughs> we're talking to right women. Now, it's a free roll, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so I, I think we need to uh, talk about boundaries, and um, I think maybe boundaries should be added to the uh, facilities committee. Um, and if that's the case, that's an awful lot of stuff with the facilities committee. So that's why I would be maybe open to having a third committee. As, as Chad said, uh, my, my recollection when we had active committees before we had the three, we, we didn't have a budget committee at all. The budget was discussed with the full board and regular board meetings or workshops like this. That was a separate part. So budget was added in the December update or voted on in your, it's your operating procedures. So obviously you guys can calibrate it any way you'd like. Um, but the, I wanted to mention the policy committee was typically like when we have a big policy update from TASB, they would vet, that committee would vet the policies so that the full board didn't have to spend a lot of time. I mean, you could spend as much time as you needed to, but they would, uh, but you also get into local policies as well. So it was strictly policy, and that's why it was a committee that stood alone. Uh, the in innovation committee looked at innovative ideas and programming in the district and things we could do differently, technology, and along those lines. So I think it's perfectly appropriate if, if you want a separate budget committee that can dig deeper on the budget to come to the full board. And I'd also say these meetings are posted, so I particularly remember Mr. Chadwell um, coming to a lot of the meetings, you know, and sitting and observing of all the committees, because I was, I think I was, I wasn't, I was at each, all the committee meetings. So, but that was kind of the, the way it was calibrated before. So I think how you go about it is totally up to you. We have new board members, um, you know, and whatever your vision is so for that. So would budget issues be more <clears throat> suited in the innovation side of it so that you could look for innovative ways to save money? It, and it could be, but we didn't have a budget committee before. So budget affects facilities, budget affects innovation. So those discussions take place. But as far as budgetary, you know, projections like you're talking about with our situation that we're looking at and the forecast depending on the legislative session, 
Um, but we didn't have a budget committee before. Right. So why the board, I mean, the board added in, in December of 2017 to the commit to that committee, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's, you know, you guys can do whatever you like. I just think like. we need to err on the side of caution <clears throat> that we're going to create so many committees that we might as well go back to workshops. Well, and I'll add to that, uh, Mr. Mass comment on boundaries. That was usually a, a conversation in the facilities committee, but it, we did, it wasn't lined out that this is the facilities and boundary committee because, you know, then you could say it's, you can make a long list of all the things to do with facilities because the capacity of facility was a, definitely a consideration in those committee meetings. Well, and, and if you saw my face when you said that, it's not because I don't think boundaries need to be addressed. I definitely think boundaries need to be addressed. It's just it's such a massive project, and it really, um, I, I'm, I have some ideas. Now, I only mention it because it's a massive project, but I think there's an urgency to it. Absolutely. And I want to make sure we and I start have some talking. ideas on and, how. And actually, the first thing is advise on effective utilization of current facilities. So that does yeah. lend itself okay. to boundaries. boundaries. Then that discussion. would be great. Mm -hmm. So, again, kind of the whole concept of this is to get things going. In a way, I've, I've always thought we should have, have a, we have a standing bond oversight committee. We're finding out that there's some questions about that. In the past, it was more just an update. Here's what's going on. Here's where bond 0814 money's being spent. Here's the progress. And it was just a general update. I've always wanted to have a, something similar or an adjunct to that, a standing bond study committee. So we always, so when we do, when we decide to go out for a bond, it's not a long eight month progress like process like it was last year. That's a very in depth, that's a lot of work, but guess what? All of this stuff fits in there. You know, facilities, boundaries, our buses, even our buses. If we redrew boundaries, maybe, okay, we don't need to send all these buses over here. It's all interrelated. And so I, I agree we need to be on the side of caution that we, we need to look at this. But in this case, I'd say let's try a few meetings, see how it goes, bring back, have the committees bring back to the full board. If you overlap a little bit, that's fine. At least you know that that's becoming an issue that we all need to look at. If you start saying, okay, the facilities over here is saying we might look at boundaries and the utilization of uh, current facilities, but then the, the policy says, well, what do we, I think our policy, we need to look at our policy and say, what is the ideal size of an elementary school and a middle school? And at some point we say, you know, we need to, we need to change something. And that gets into the boundaries. So again, don't, let's not fret over the details of the words here. Let's get these started. Let's give it a try. These are our policies. These aren't state-driven. We can always tweak them, adjust them, waive them for a month, six months, set them aside. These are just guidelines. And we have so much. We have so many projects. How many hundreds of projects do we have? Hundreds. We have, we have you know, five big ones, and then we have hundreds. Of, if you count all the roofs and air conditioners, a lot. President Chadwell, just in the first year, we're, we're in the neighborhood of 140 projects or project lines. In year one. And those are, so there's a lot that has to be done. We're grateful that we have a bond that passed strong. We've got a lot to do um, and we have a lot to go forward. It all, again, it all relates to the budget. Do we want to set a sub separate budget committee? I don't think we want to do that yet. If we don't set a separate committee, maybe we could just sort of have a subcommittee is what I was thinking. Of the three, or even just to say this would just be, even though we don't have the word facilities in it, we would assume because the other bullets did that it should have facilities right. I think that's and just good. stick with facilities right now and then, you know, figure out yeah. what we're going to. I'm really passionate about making sure that we're staying laser focused and that we as a board can provide support to staff as they're managing these massive amounts of projects and, and, and really, something that we do at my day job is we evaluate the cost of a meeting. So we take you know, an average hourly salary of how much everybody is sitting in the room makes and say, okay, this one hour meeting is costing the company $1,200 if you just looked at salaried costs and stuff. And so I just think about when you have a lot of people that are in those positions to make decisions, how much is that costing the district to have them all sitting in the room? And so I just want to make sure that we're being wise with our resources if we're asking staff to come and I, meet with us. I agree. And, I, that's, and again, this kind of goes back to the, the advantage of committees is you don't have to have the full board. You don't have to have the full staff. You can have facilities, the director of facilities. And 
um, and, and then start there. We can always do it. But again, I don't want anybody to get so say, oh, this is beyond our scope. Because I remember getting it. I asked a question when we had the Hopewell building. I think there was something about well, why weren't budgets? And I said, I think I know the answer because we didn't specify it in the charter. Mm -hmm. And then, but you know, I heard many times going to the bond oversight bond sure. study committee, citizen CBC, citizen bond study committees. People were saying, you know, if we redrew some boundaries here, we might not need to build a wing on this school. Sure. We could fix the portable issue over here. Oh, no, we can't talk about that. So, so can, I mean, I know we can't really vote, but how many people would like to see this, like, laser focus just on facility long term? Yeah. yeah. I, I, so I, I'm seeing that that's, it feels like that's a majority. So can we, can we see about adding that or changing yeah, at the end and stuff. Okay. But I, I would say that I, I agree that I think that the facilities committee should just be facilities. But I, I think we could probably move budgetary and financial issues up to the policy committee. Um, I, I think there's some alignment there looking over those, those um, bullet points okay. that, that – it could work better than because I, I agree with you. I, I don't think we should. Obviously, I don't think we should just not talk about it. Um, so, if there's going to be a better alignment, I think it's up in the policy. So, okay. would we need? If are are you, are you suggesting that we could actually have an action item today, or would we have to do that on the twenty eighth? This and this. So then we might want to, if we are changing the last item on the facilities, maybe to Corey's point, we want to ch add something up to the policy to say that our finance, yeah. the facilities and finance is really a, a facilities committee, mm -hmm. and maybe it's policy and budget is a separate committee. I don't know. And I'm, that would I, make, I, 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 I'm good with that. <laughs> okay. You, you two did the policy change tweak to the police task force. I'm okay with tweaking it. I, I, and I like the laser, laser focus, but I don't want you guys to get down somewhere and be, I would consider these exploratory committees. I can, one, I, one no, I know where you're we coming from. I, I, okay. I, I, yeah, we're not we going to, okay. I don't think, right. and, and we don't have that. I think since we're trustees, we're, we don't have that issue that I think the citizens committees have where they're trying to be very respectful of the charter they've been given. Yeah. Not that we won't be respectful, but you know, we'll, We'll just okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll so, dig in. I'm good with that. I with think that, big, we can work on that. Well, when, and when we propose at the end of the meeting, then perhaps that can, can be a again. I'm I'm a flexible <laughs> on one hand. I want it focused. Of, okay, but I don't want it to be so rigid that you can't. Sure. You know, all of a sudden you say, "Wow, what if we I look get at you?" It? And if you overlap, you know, it's, it'll be great. So with that, um, and and one thing I would like to encourage citizen involvement you know, participation or input, because there's some great, we have some people who really contributed last year to our bond study committee who are up to speed, and we want as many helpful help uh, on this as possible. I'll leave that up to the, to the committees, how, how you work it, but um, take input. Let's, let's take advantage of the uh, expertise that we have out there, especially when people have, who live in a certain portion of the district may say, you know, if you just change mm -hmm. this drop-off zone here or you did something, that might be able to help a little bit. And well, hopefully I think we, we always can... encourage yeah. uh, anyone to email us or, but as far as being a part of, is that what you're, you want I them? I want them to participate. Now, are they voting? Are they members? We don't have to specify that here, but I want to be able to say we are, are turning to our community for uh, guidance and input. And I think, like, especially if we were to do something like boundaries, it's, that's going to be really important to get community input. But, you know, I mean, Jenny, maybe we could work with you and we could do Facebook Live meetings where people can send in their questions online because if they're stuck at home watching kids, if they're doing things like that, you don't want to also force people to be coming every Monday or every other Monday. Exactly. You could do a lot and of things with technology that could get input from across the district. And and I, I know you guys know this, but there, there's a policy that governs a boundary change. So anytime yeah. that right now that's in policy, you know, you host meetings at the, all schools that will be affected. And you, put, you know, so everybody has a chance. And there's normally a, right. a boundary committee that's appointed for that specific change in time or that point in time to make a change. 
And I think that would be a after. You know what I mean? Because really, it, that would have to be a, a board decision when we got to that. So and if we just took the input on ideas that people have around the district about boundaries, then we could come back these and These are say, general ideas yeah, about boundaries. General By ideas, no means not, are these recommendations because we don't change boundaries normally until we open a school, and that's the year before. But we, also, we all know, we look at the uh, weekly report, the enrollment report, and we see some of these schools at 150% capacity and some that are 50% capacity. Well, maybe not that low, but they're, and that's what's causing so much anxiety, I think, in, at the Capitol and certainly at Austin ISD. They're getting ready to shut down, what, a dozen or school, so schools because of that problem. They have some that are 100% capacity, 150, mm -hmm. and some that are way under enrolled. I want us to get ahead of that so we're not in that position in a year or two. And Again, these boundaries issue discussions are not binding by any means. They're just guidelines. And we have, we have such, the parents in this community are so educated on this. And, and I think if we, you know, lay out the parameters of what the rules are for boundaries, you know, because there are, you know, some federal guidelines you have to follow, socioeconomic and race and all of those things that, but I, I think the more information they have, the yeah. better it'll be down the road. And, and you know, one of the things that, that has caused us problems in the past is when we, when we set up committees with citizens, uh, you know, we say, okay, each trustee is going to appoint one or two or whatever, or the, the district has, the administration has appointed people, there might be 30 that are appointed or 40, and then half of them show up on a regular basis. And then the information starts getting out, and then another half say, hey, I would like to participate. And many times our committee, our charters say, well, if you didn't sign up at the beginning, you can't participate now. Uh, you know, this. and see, I think that's where, it, like these committees, if if we decide, whoever's on the finance committee, you you could, you could say we're going to do Facebook Live. We're going to let everybody and not have just set people all the time. Exactly. Who feel like only those twelve people are allowed to comment. You that's can, right. Right. you can o really have it open. Okay. Town right. hall meeting style. Yeah, town hall meeting. We're a town hall meeting where we get input. So I think that's something completely different than committees. Yeah, I don't think these are town hall meetings. This is, if we're going to talk about being laser focused, these need to be laser focused. These are not town hall meetings. Well, I, I, I see. I, we can't talk about being laser focused, and then I open agree with it. you, I Nikki. Those, I mean, I'm I'm all up for town hall meetings. Absolutely, all up. But they are not the same entity. Okay. Well, then it's a combination of a town hall meeting to no. get to before before you get where you need the laser focus how do you know where to laser focus until you've got so are, who wants to be laser focused like i think i mean it's going to gonna happen focused. whether you do it or not these are publicly posted meetings it's not like we have a town hall on the the safety and security task force but those are live streamed on facebook live every time we have it so and there, people comment, and people send us emails. But there's emails a difference in interaction, in having the Facebook Live, and then us as sitting board members interacting with that. Those are two different things. We don't interact with with Facebook Live. We either be laser focused, or or we have social media Facebook Live. I, I, I see those. I think that there's a level things. of comfort with some members of the board in terms of engaging with social media that other members of the board may not have and and i understand that yes i do and not live on social media it, it's certainly you know up to that per that committee to determine how they want to function um so as, as a board you know that that we have these committees that will be assigned and they will determine whether they want to function as being social media or laser focused well i think that more input or less input <laughs> and and you could call that laser focused versus social media but you know i definitely understand that the more input you get you know the harder it is to hone in on a decision quickly but I'm, I'm these are definitely input. i'm talking about facebook live and social media I, I am all for input. Stop me in HEB. Send me an email. Give me a phone call. I mean, but I'm some of us talking, work with social down. media like that. I mean, I, I use it all the time. Like, I don't have a problem if engaging people. They don't have to call me. I think Sandra to, wants to Sam, say something. Yeah. And, and there may be, like, we may not be able to legally do it. That's what probably Sandra's saying. <laughs> but, I mean, anyway. I just, 
just I, I, I offer this. I just want to offer this for your consideration, because when it comes to policy making, the board has the ability and the authority to make policy, but you also have the uh, the authority and the ability to discuss that policy. It, while you, it's sort of like the audit idea, right? In the working papers, while you're still considering the pros and cons of whatever decision you may make as it relates to policy, you have a right to protect that discussion, the, the uh, integrity of the discussion before you make a decision on where you're going with the policy. That's separate and apart from getting input, maybe having establishing some citizen community members that you want to facilitate or gain some input, or if you want to have a town hall before you all are going to sit as a committee and discuss what it is you're going to do. But again, you want to just be aware, and as you all know, you want to be aware of the fact that the input is appropriate, but the decision making is ultimately going to rest with the board, and you want to be able to have retain your ability to have I, whatever the dialogue I, is that I agree you may with, have as trustees. I, wasn't, that, I agree with that. that the so the I, decision, the, the committees are going to come back with a recommendation, one or two or whatever, and say we've dug in, this is what we think, we'll have a discussion here, and then the board will... We'll make a decision on it. So I agree. Thanks for clearing I that up. And, that and I, I just want—I I mean, I shouldn't have used town hall so flippantly, but because I don't think that there's going to be citizen input when we're talking about air conditioners, right? I mean, that—that's just going to be a small group, or you know, maybe we work with the bond <laughs> oversight committee on their charter, so we're not both doing the same jobs of oversight. But I do think if we are going to pull boundaries into that, there is going to be a point where even if we're not making recommendations, we're going to have to let people, I mean, get it out, you know, They're, let them have a say. I mean, even if we don't respond back, we've, we've got to kind of open. Oh, absolutely. And I, don't we usually have like a boundaries committee when we actually start talking about boundaries right. that is citizens? Right. Not so. Us. Right. So there is and that so. opportunity before we start talking about boundaries to have that input. Okay, with, yes. So with that, well, here's, here's my recommendation, is we go ahead, we set these committees up, uh, the chairs work with the committee members, get the date set, uh, have a couple of meetings, give us an update. If, if you have a meeting before the 28th, our next board meeting, give us a brief update. We're not, recommend, we're not asking for a recommendation at that point, but get it started. Let's go through this process a little bit and see how it works and get, let's get it started here because we have, this has been idle, this, these committees process has been idle for a few years. So let's get it rolling. If we need to tweak it, we can. We just can't tweak it the same night. We have right. to do a vote. But even that, I think this is a good enough guideline for us to get started. So year. is it going to be, are we going to make the change to make it a policy and budget committee and then a facilities committee? I, I don't want to, I don't really want to create a new one I think there was enough support point. for that of, on people who were talking. You want to start another, a third committee? No, 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 no. just oh. combining budget with the policy committee and taking it out of facilities. Uh, I think that, that if we're, because if we're signing, like we're kind of setting people up right now, then like obviously I want to be on the budget committee, so I need to know where I'm going. <laughs> So you're I'm, saying move budget, create one, and put it into... We'll just move no. that, that little bullet from... Oh, the last one? From facilities and finance and just make it facilities and then move it up, that last bullet, up into policy. policy. And now it's the... What was the first... Uh, it could still be policy. Policy, innovation. budget, and innovation committee. <laughs> Okay. Uh, again, I, I think budget by default covers is always an underlying discussion. I, I, I agree with them, though. This is huge. Like we're we have a massive influx of projects. They they need to be focused on. I don't want to get lost with my priorities. I I want to be able to do my work and okay. and and I feel like they really need to do their work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so with that, you, you want to be on facilities. facilities. Are you willing to chair it? Yes. Okay, who else wants to be on facilities? I think we're switching a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so these three, do you all want to be facilities? Okay, 
Mason wants to lead policy That's and good. innovation, I think, or wants to be on it. Are you okay with being on that? If, as long as we can get started, I'm ready to do whatever. And Are you I'll okay? I'll be on I'm the policy, innovation, and budget committee. And budget. Okay. You, great. How's that? <laughs> Everybody happy? I think so. This is, again, this is exploratory. <clears throat> Go out. Let's get as much done. Bring back what you can to us. And, who, and Mason's the chair of the policy, innovation, and budget committee. That's, is that yeah. correct? Okay. I think Marty can correct me if I'm wrong, but to, to actually change these procedures will have to be voted on in an okay. upcoming meeting, so it'll yeah. be an on agenda item. Yeah. And okay. I would say three three item. I mean, the committee having three topics: uh, innovation and but that's those are three pretty large topics okay. as well. But I, if if I would tell, I'd say the board, if you go in that direction, and you have some meetings and there's too much to cover, or the then we can then we you can, can recalibrate at any time because yeah. they're your sure. procedures, right? So. <laughs> Okay, so the chairs will set the dates, and you all work with each other, and then, but of course, you need to get the administration, the participants in the administration. So I have one more logistical question since I'm new with this. Is that, is um, and I know that one of our new facility committee members isn't always in town. Um, is it possible to hold these meetings and you can help me with, if we were to do them during the week. Remotely? With uh, FaceTime Steve in, in or? I think we can because they're committees. They're not board meetings. Is that right? So, so they're still called board meetings. You're still hosting, but uh, generally the, the uh, video or audio prank applies to a uh, full board meeting. Because we're not voting at those. So can we have a... Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I didn't want to be limited to yeah. just no, the weekends. I, I really mean thank you. Okay, I, good. I'd well, like and to I know... participate, but if I could participate by phone, that would be great. Well, and your time back in Austin is probably very valuable to your family, and adding another requirement of you while you're in town, I'm sure would... No, I, I appreciate that. So thank you. So if there's a way that we can, and maybe we can look at the Open Meetings Act and all of that, and we can meet during the week. And I know you're chairing, but I, I just wanted to make sure if there's a way that we can include Steve in as much as we can, that would be great. And, and again, you can, because it's a smaller group, you can meet on a, on a whatever is flexible for you on an after Monday morning, Friday afternoon. Again, whatever is the convenience and the availability of the staff. Always be respectful of their time and their availability. Don't just set a, a date and expect that they will show up. Um, and um, but you're if you want to meet the evenings during the day, the weekends, it's now it's your call. So okay. it's a small group. You have a little bit more. But so again, then if we're going to meet like that, then we're not going to be broadcasting it. Uh, you can. We can we can set it up here in here. We can. There's FaceTime. That's uh, maybe enough. To so I think up. what we've been doing is we for transparency's sake, we have been broadcasting every meeting, and I think we need to stick with that standard. Okay, well, we can, you can have it in here. It takes, um, it takes a little bit more to set up the, uh, the work in there, and maybe we can, but yeah, I agree. It I mean, if we're be. talking about everybody participating and wanting to be involved, like you said, a mom with three or four kids can't be sitting here right now, but they want to know what's going on. So then I do think that if we okay. talk about that, then we actually have to put it in force. Yeah, that's fine. And we're getting better with technology that uh, that's always an option. I would like to find a way for the committees to go meet at other campuses. And if that means getting a, a camera and broadcasting it just so people can see, you know, so when you go to these meetings. That was always very valuable when I went to the bond oversight committees. We would always go to a different campus and you'd do a quick tour around and see and you say oh that's very enlightening oh eye-opening to see that so to answer your question nikki yes do a combination of both and we have if we can record it but again i think the technology is getting better yeah i was going to say in in your operating procedures under c4 uh rules for the committee meetings of all board committees shall be videotaped or audio recorded obviously audio recorded is and it doesn't say live but audio recorded is much easier to do in remote places than the video part that's a little bit more difficult to set up um, to have everything on video, correct? So we had two two board meetings or committee uh, bond oversight meet bond study. Get my acronyms right. One at Cedar Ridge and one at uh, 
uh, Cedar Valley, and they were great, but it took a lot of work for them to set it up. So I think it's getting... Uh, audio recording, obviously, is the easiest. Video recording is not difficult either. What's challenging is the web streaming at a different location because we're set up and we have all of the equipment here. Okay. So that that's what does become... So as long as it's not live. And you, right, and you might recall, like, at the uh, Cedar Ridge all the equipment that Jennifer had to take over there and that, that substantial amount of yeah. time. Okay. Well, we have some great high school kids with lots of great equipment. You know, maybe we could let them try one or two, you know, where they broadcast it and live, live stream it. So, all right. Well, I'm excited to get this try and let it get rolling here. So, all right. Any other comments? Okay. So we, we jumped ahead to E3 and... E4. So we're everybody's got their, and again, I'm I'm not on the, any of the committees officially, but I will drop in periodically, and I'm an. Well, and I think we had talked about that. That's for all board members. If you want to participate, or if you want to be a part, and know exactly what's going on, you're welcome to. And I that's think true. we had talked about even maybe sitting on the dais if you wanted to participate as well. Leave that open to all board members. Yep. Is how do we feel about that? I like it. Okay. I'm good with that. Great. Okay. Any other comments, suggestions? Very good. We'll go to agenda item F. Uh, reserves the right to go into closed session. We have any need for that right now? Good. I'm going to go to that. And um, I'm going to. We can we go? To, we're going to the meeting. The date. What is this on here for? Oh, team of eight. Uh, we still are trying to get a team of eight. Have we gotten anywhere close? I know Patty has sent out some information so on that. So we're not doing the Lone Star governance? Well, we're going to do the, I thought we were going to do the team of eight first, but we can integrate both of them together. I think that's an all-day, that's a two-day thing. And that's I wanted in to get July, some, I believe. It's in July. Yeah. So yeah. we did miss the yeah. cohort application. There was an application process. Oh, there was okay. a deadline. The deadline was March the 8th to have a um, TEA um, Person, I mean, Lone Star Governance, sorry, a Lone Star Governance. That was with the cohorts group here in Austin, right? For the that, one. So if we would have applied before March 8th, then it would have been a year-long process where someone would have come in. After we'd gone to the two-day training, someone would have come in and helped us actually implement the things that we had learned um, it would have been all expenses paid and nothing at the cost of the district. So now, if we choose to go to the Lone Star Governance training in July, when we walk out of there at the end of the second day, you're on your own. Which is better than nothing. Um, I am still very interested in Lone Star Governance, but um, if we had applied before March 8th for the deadline, then we could have been considered for this cohort program. And then I believe there's something that also happened in the second year, um, but that first year is really intensive where you get assigned a trainer that comes and helps with um, agenda development and um, monitoring and really helps you focus on that academic achievement part of it and what to, what to look at and things like that. So we are still open to attending the training. It's July. I think I saw 14th and 15th or 15th and 16th or 16th and 17th. It's around that time from 14 to 17 in there somewhere. Um, so I, you know, I would still highly encourage us to do that as a board. Um, but we missed the deadline for that, and I don't know if they're if they filled all the spots or if we will, you know, could apply for. If they didn't, think about us as a second round. I don't know, but well, we did miss that deadline. Can we get a team of eight scheduled first to kind of go over our? Um, and the team of eight training is with the superintendent and us, and it's discuss about uh, where do we invest our time as far as. Um, uh, conferences, meetings, training. You're going to be going to Philadelphia, right, at the end of the month mm -hmm. here. Um, general general follow-up to what you guys, the new trustees, were exposed to the first week or so when you had that training at the uh, board admin. So so it's not a facilitated? We don't bring in a facilitator? We can. We, oh, yeah, we can. We can bring in a facilitator. So uh, just my can. personal opinion, I'm, I am totally looking forward to Team of Eight training, but if it's becoming really difficult to find time to schedule one for all of us. So if we keep putting off this decision of making um, a decision for um, 
for Lone Star Governance, I, I checked just like two days ago, I believe, and there were four spots left for the July Lone Star Governance. Okay. So if we don't get our team of eight training scheduled for another month, and then at that point, then we discuss, do we want to attend it? You know, are we supposed to, as a team of eight, supposed to be keeping those days open on our calendar? I know summer schedules fill up really fast for us. And so do we need to be holding that date? And if we do wait until after team of eight, we may not have a spot in that training at all. If we can sign up for it, and, you know, maybe we can ask uh, Patty or Georgia to look into it, see if we can sign up for it. And, and as, a, as an option, if there's the cohort, I did see something about the cohorts. There were slots open for the cohort. No, the cohort deadline was March the 8th. Okay. Well, is it, if, it's, if that's closed. So uh, you, you all have had more exposure recently. The Lone Star Governance, and this is what I'd like to talk about in the uh, team of eight, is to get more of an update. It was originally designed for, and we're, um, originally designed for campuses, uh, districts that were falling behind, but I think they've tweaked it now. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to find out more about it before we, so we had yeah. A.J. Craybill come and give us an abbreviated version back in uh, the second week of May, 22 years ago, 2017. And I attended a session at Winter Governance that was entirely focused on Lone Star Governance, and um, I believe it was Natalia ISD, is that, a, is that the name of an ISD south of San Antonio? Yes? Okay. So I think it was Natalia ISD, and three of their board members and their superintendent came and presented to us, and just the way that it had their pre-Lone Star governance sounded similar to our model. Six-hour meetings, meeting quite frequently, leaving, going, wow, we talked about a whole lot, but did we really hold any accountability on academic achievement? You know, those kind of things. Um, to now they meet three times a month. They don't meet more than two hours a month. They track their meetings by minutes, and they have a goal as a board to spend at least 50% of their minutes on academic achievement every meeting, and um, okay. they've, well, seen the, they've seen the return on that investment in their okay. scores. All right, we're I going. just sent uh, Patty an email with the actual link to Lone Star Governance to see what's going to be what what our options would okay, be great. and how we could participate. Okay. okay, that'd be great. Thank you. So one of the things we can also talk about, and if you looked at the uh, Lone Star magazine that came out two weeks ago, they talked about XG exceptional governance, and it's a similar plan. They have differences, but that would be another option that we could look at. Similar goal: optimize the board focus to uh, student outcome. So. All right, we've spent way too long on that, but let's keep going on it. So any further topics? Um, I'd like to propose rewriting the policy um, for committees and changing that focus um, that we talked about, so for okay. future topic. That's fine. With the to vote on the 28th. The yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it's a small tweak. We can just yeah. reword it here. And then vote on it on the 28th. That's good. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments? 836, we're adjourned. How about that?